My stream's up. Sergeant, can you start the recordings? PC recording rolling. Cloud recording is up. Backup Great. is rolling. Sergeant Martinez, could you give us the opening, please? Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, International and, and Intergroup Relations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at uh, testimony at council dot nyc dot gov once again that email is testimony at council dot nyc dot gov thank you for your cooperation we are ready to begin thank you good morning everyone and welcome to this hearing of the committee on cultural affairs libraries and international intergroup relations i am council member jimmy van bramer chair of this committee and we are now formally in session. Uh, as I have mentioned in previous years, this marks the 23rd straight year where I am in attendance at this hearing. The first 11 as a staff member for the Queens Public Library. And uh, this is my 12th as the chair of this committee. So 20, nearly a quarter of a century of uh, budget hearings on cultural affairs and uh, libraries. This afternoon, we will be discussing the fiscal year 2022 preliminary expense and capital budget for our three great public library systems. For FY22, the administration is proposing a $403.2 million subsidy for the systems. Uh, the 22 prelim capital commitment plan, which covers fiscals 2021 through 2025, includes $903.7 million for the systems. The 10-year capital strategy, which is released every two years, provides $830.6 million in fiscal years 2022 through 2031 for capital construction and reconstruction projects for the systems. And I'm sure that we'll be hearing a lot from our three presidents and CEOs about the uh, capital plan for sure, particularly the long-term uh, commitment by the city to our three systems. Now, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, our three library systems quickly pivoted their work to provide online, and virtual services and programs when neighborhood branches were forced to close. A year later, more branches are reopening in the ways that are safe uh, for people to access the incredible materials and, and services of our three library systems. But I wanna point out, and I think it's incredibly important to point out that the three systems, even while these community libraries were closed for traditional public library service, worked closely uh, and incredibly importantly with the administration and with all of the various city agencies, as well as local communities uh, to provide life saving services, and I mean that. During this time of incredible difficulty and even fear, the ARB public library systems were not only making 2020 census outreach possible, they were, uh, and still are in many cases, using the library branches as COVID testing sites, uh, working very closely with uh, the health and hospitals, uh, test and trace core, and even serving as uh, polling locations when uh, we had our elections. I think it's fair to say that the sense of isolation over the last 12 months has been incredibly uh, powerful uh, and daunting for so many of us. And our public libraries have always been 
a place where people connect, connect to one another, connect to ideas, uh, and feel hope. And even in this most challenging of years, our three public library systems have uh, not failed uh, to fulfill their mission uh, to the people of the city of New York. Uh, and so, as, as we always say, because it's always true, it's more important than ever that we stand by our three public library systems and the courageous, and I mean courageous, uh, men and women who work for our public library systems, who have continued to work uh, and to serve, uh, even uh, as they themselves were confronting what everyone else was confronting. So this is a time, uh, even in these challenging times, to look at this budget with a lens uh, toward equity, knowing that our libraries have always been that first line of defense, right? That first place where those with the least stand to gain the most simply by having access to their public libraries. Now we are of course disappointed to see a reduction to operation subsidies to the systems with a total reduction of 4.3 million in FY 2021 and a uh, proposed $10.3 million reduction in fiscal 22. Even though that may sound like a small amount of money, relatively speaking, um, our libraries need uh, the funding to be able to do this work. Uh, and I might add that the uh, proposed uh, reduction um, in 22 is one that uh, cuts to the bone in ways that could seriously impact uh, the library's abilities to do their work um, and uh, maintain all of their staffing levels uh, as we currently uh, know them. So for FY 2021, the council allocated uh, 15.4 million dollars through council initiatives supporting the city's first readers program, adult literacy, and the digital inclusion and literacy initiatives. These programs have helped keep our libraries connected to their uh, constituents, our constituents, uh, during the pandemic and highlight the need for a continued commitment to our libraries by the city of New York. It is essential that the budget that we adopt this year uh, be transparent and accountable and reflective of the priorities and interests of the council and the people we represent. Our libraries are truly the most democratic institutions we have in our city, continuing to provide New Yorkers in every neighborhood with educational resources, services, and programs. So I look forward to active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure that the fiscal year 2022 adopted budget meets the goals the council has set out and meets the needs of the people of the city of New York. And you cannot do that without supporting our public libraries. You cannot do that without supporting our public libraries. So I want to recognize the members of the committee who are here with us today. I believe Councilmember Francisco Moya, Councilmember Mark Jonai, Councilmember Dharma Diaz, and if there are any other uh, council members who are here, um, the staff will text me and let me know. Appreciate that. I think I got everyone right now. I also want to recognize uh, the staff who have worked to put together the hearing, uh, and that includes Jack Bernadavis, my legislative director, Matt Wallace, my chief of staff as well as the committee's counsel, Brenda McKinney, our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our principal financial analyst, Alia Ali. So with that, I will hand it over to our uh, counsel for today to um, recognize our three presidents and CEOs um, and begin the testimony on behalf of the libraries. But I just wanna say personally, before I do that, I should just thank um, uh, Dennis Walcott, uh, Linda Johnson, Tony Marks, and their teams, because I know and I see uh, members of your teams throughout all of these little boxes. 
uh, on behalf of the city of New York, thank you. I know that this has been an incredibly challenging year for you all as well um, and your teams, and uh, you have not uh, stopped serving the people of the city of New York. Um, we, are, we are in awe, quite frankly, of how quickly libraries pivoted uh, and adopted um, and have served in so many ways. As Dennis knows, I have uh, uh, been tested for COVID at several Queens Public Library locations over the last uh, 12 months, and, uh, and uh, I'm always uh, amazed at how, not amazed because I know, but, but just thrilled to see a library step up for the city. And of course, the city needs to continue stepping up for our public libraries. So with that, thank you. And I will um, hand it over to our uh, staff person who's going to uh, tell us where we go from here. Um, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. I'm Anastasia Zimina. I'm a legislative policy analyst at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Um, I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations um, due to my Russian accent. I will do my best. Um, so before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you're called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council members' questions will be limited to five minutes. Council members, please note that this includes both your question and the panel and the witnesses' response. Please also note that we will not allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panel should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner, Department of Cultural Affairs. Sheila Feinberg, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Cultural Affairs. Philippa Shao, Director of Finance. I will deliver the oath to all three of you. And after I will call upon each of you individually to respond to the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Casals. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner. I do. Michelle. I do. Thank you. Commissioner Casals, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Commissioner, uh, before you uh, <clears throat> testify, just a <laughs> bit of uh, housekeeping, because I think um, uh, the order of this, uh, I am, I am uh, trying to figure out. Um, I, I uh, believed that libraries were um, on at 10 and, and DCLA was on uh, subsequent, um, but I, I am uh, trying to confirm that uh, with the, uh, the committee staff right now. But as we do that, we have um, the newest member of the committee who has joined us. So it gives me an opportunity to both welcome uh, council member uh, Jim Gennaro back uh, uh, formally um, and, and that is heartfelt, but it is also a, um, uh, a stall tactic because we are trying to figure out um, the order <laughs> of who goes first. Uh, and I'm sure it's okay with all of you, both our library presidents and CEOs and Commissioner Casals, um, but uh, I apologize for any um, inconvenience uh, uh, here. Um, so uh, welcome uh, formerly council member Gennaro. Uh, and uh, um, so um, 
if this is all right with everyone, um, I am told that uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, has won the coin toss um, and uh, we will um, uh, hear from Gonzalo and then we will go right to uh, the three presidents and CEOs. Um, is that all right with uh, our presidents and CEOs? Okay, I think I got the thumbs up from everybody. Um, all right, I apologize again for for that. Uh, so, uh, uh, Commissioner Casals, if you could begin your testimony. Um, I think this is a historical precedent, um, Chair. Um, we would always go after the libraries. Uh, thank you for the libraries to um, allow us to go first. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. I'm here today to testify regarding the mayor's proposed preliminary budget for fiscal year 2021. I'm joined by my colleagues, Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg and Finance Director Philippe Achao. I'll start with a review of the figures from the preliminary budget. The FY22 preliminary budget for the CLA is $143.6 million, which includes $107 million for cultural institutions group, $28.5 million for the cultural development fund, $1.25 million for energy at groups on DCLA property, and $6.9 million for agency operations and other expenses. At this point, in the budget process, these figures do not include any funding items typically added at budget adoption, like city council member items and mayoral increases. This represents a 4 million decrease from this point in the budget process last year, or a 2.7% um, decrease. We are committed to maintaining robust funding for New York's cultural community, despite the extraordinary fiscal challenges caused by the pandemic. The agency's current FY21 budget now stands at $187.5 million. This, this includes a $1 million cut implemented as part of the IPEG that all agencies were asked to meet. Despite the ongoing fiscal challenges faced by the city, this budget remains high by historical standards and an important source of support for cultural nonprofits across the city. One year ago, I was appointed commissioner of DCLA, DCLA in the early days of the pandemic, no one could predict the severity of the challenges that lay ahead. In my last days as director of the Les Lomans Museum, we participated in a weekly check-in call with peer institutions to determine when to open, thinking that the temporary shutdown would be measured in days. I know we weren't alone in underestimating the impact of the pandemic would have on our cultural institutions and our whole city. Since then, we all have seen and experienced loss, trauma, and upheaval of our daily lives, but not everyone has been impacted by the pandemic in the same way. We're face, what we're facing is really a triple crisis, the public health crisis of COVID-19, the crisis caused by the systemic racism and inequities in our society, and the unprecedented economic crisis. And the cultural community, despite going through tremendous suffering, fear, and loss alongside their fellow New Yorkers, has been incredibly resilient in dealing with this scenario and still to continue to connect with New Yorkers in ways that they needed most. Early on, DCLA worked with cultural groups to transform their public facilities into station sites for ambulances, COVID testing sightings, and food pantries. Now it's look to recovery, we're transforming cultural spaces into vaccination sites and spaces for healing and wellness. We have partnered with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and New York City and Company to collect and highlight the incredible range of virtual offerings. Um, and we convene the sector to discuss urgent topics and connect them with resources for opening safely and programming in outdoor spaces. We allow more than a thousand cultural development fund recipients to change the scope of work in their FY20 and FY21 applications so they could continue to receive city support and provide cultural services to New Yorkers. As a commissioner, I want to commend my team for their enthusiasm, passion, and care for the sector, even as they dealt with the challenges brought by the pandemic. There is so much work to do. And on the other, on the one hand, we need the focus on the recovery of the cultural sector itself. Layoffs, loss of revenues, and cancel of programs have devastated the organizations we work with. 
We conducted a survey in L early in the pandemic that tried to measure this loss. What it showed was not surprising. Over half a million dollars in lost revenue and 78% of our, our artists working in arts educations have been laid off, among other um, findings. Thanks for the council continued partnership. We were able to target investments to these hardest hit areas in FY21. Just yesterday, we closed a response to a follow-up survey, um, results of which will be released later this spring. We hope it will contribute to a powerful tool for advocacy and help direct resources where they are needed most. We also need to focus on culture's contribution to the city's recovery as a whole. Culture is essential to every community in New York City where it provides local jobs and makes healthier, safer neighborhoods. It's also a cornerstone of New York City status as a world cultural capital, attracting artists and visitors from all over the world. What's good for culture is good for New York City. We're just starting down the road to recovery. We look forward to working with you in the weeks and months ahead to wear a budget that supports the needs of our cultural community at this critical time and to fighting for a fair and equitable recovery for all New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Casals, and I apologize to all involved for the um, a little switcheroo, um, but I uh, didn't get an opportunity to uh, adequately uh, introduce you, Commissioner Casals. Um, you know, I was just noticing, um, because this week is such a uh, an important week uh, in so many ways because, uh, and triggering in many ways because everything started to happen this week. And I went back and looked at my schedule uh, for this week last year and noticed that um, uh, your, your appointment as commissioner was uh, a year ago, I wanna say March 11th or, or something like that, right? March 11th, uh, you became the commissioner <laughs> for the Department of Cultural Affairs and uh, your entire uh, tenure uh, has been uh, during uh, a pandemic. And, and obviously you were personally impacted uh, in a very serious way. So I just wanna say to you also, Commissioner Casals, uh, a Queens resident, um, you know, we, we are grateful for your leadership uh, and stewardship really of our community and Grateful to have you in that position. I'll talk more a little bit about the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, and, and I kind of like the synergy of going back and forth between our public libraries and our uh, cultural uh, community because you're also uh, part of the same whole, right? You all are interconnected and, and, and doing equally important work. Uh, but because I gave such a tremendous introduction to the three presidents and CEOs, of our public library systems, uh, I want to return uh, to them and uh, and ask them to deliver their opening statements. And then, uh, with all of your uh, blessing, we will go um, uh, a little back and forth uh, between y'all and um, and get to the heart of the matter in terms of the 22 prelim budget for both of you. So, uh, public library systems, the ball is in your court and. Uh, whichever order you have chosen to go. Um, Chair, if, if I may, um, I have, I have uh, um, an order here, if, if that would be okay. Um, so the first um, panel would be Queen's Library, and that would be Mr. Dennis Walcott, President and CEO of Queen's Library. And then we also have uh, Ms. Linda E. Johnson, President CEO of Brooklyn Public Library. And we have Mr. Tony Marks, President CEO of New York Public Library. Um, so if we could begin with Mr. Dennis Walcott, please, uh, whenever you're ready. I am ready. So thank you very much. And if I may say to the chair, to my colleagues, to the commissioner, and to all the people who are participating, a gorgeous morning to all of you. It is a lovely day as far as weather-wise is concerned, and I hope you're all well. My name is Dennis Walcott, and I'm the president, CEO of the Queens Public Library. And I'm glad that uh, the chair uh, talked about him going to 
uh, the Queens Public Libraries for his testing because it would be a violation of my part from a HIPAA point of view to indicate that. But you know, it is always an honor to see the chair uh, just like we saw each other, I think it was last week at Sunnyside. So we, even in a safe environment, try to make sure we keep up with each other. So Mr. Chair, I wanna start out my presentation by thanking you for your years of service, both as a uh, important member of the Queens Public Library team, but also in your capacity as chair. Your advocacy, your support, your uh, constantly asking us the right questions has really led us extremely well and has benefited all three systems in ways that we can't even talk about in a hearing because it would take too long. So personally and collectively, I know my colleagues will do this as well. We wanna first start by saying a big thank you to you for all that you have done and continue to do as well. And that's not part of my written testimony, that's all. <laughs> And thank so, you, Dennis. Thank truly you. Truly from the heart. Uh, but as we know, we have been living, unfortunately, in a pandemic environment, which has affected every individual business and government uh, in the world. That has changed the way we interact with one another, has forced us to reconsider all things we take for granted. And Queens was at the epicenter in the beginning, as far as the virus and the outbreak in the United States nearly one year ago. Many of our communities were devastated and we all have grappled with heartbreaking losses of family members, friends, colleagues, and or neighbors and our condolences to all who are part of this and viewing this who have suffered losses as well. Uh, throughout this pandemic, the Queens Public Library has been there for our communities. Uh, as the council member indicated in his introduction, we, the three systems have evolved and rapidly turned as far as serving public once the shutdown was given. Uh, when we were faced with the physical closure of our branches, uh, we never stopped serving. Uh, we developed a full range of programs and services within the first two weeks of our closure. Uh, here at Queens Public Library, we established a full calendar of virtual activities featuring some very popular programs such as our beloved children's story times, our Zumba classes, our weekly hip hop, DJ sessions, which proved to be extremely popular where it became more than once a week. We increased it to two times a week with Ralph McDaniels on Instagram Live. We organized virtual author talks, book clubs, workshops on health and wellness, technology, arts and crafts, civic engagement, literacy, and other diverse cultural programs. We developed online programs in more than a dozen languages rather quickly. Uh, last month alone, uh, the Queens Public Library hosted a 24-hour Black Health Summit and Healing virtual summit to focus on issues including mental health, health equity, parenting, civil rights and racism and disproportionate effects of the virus. And over 7,000 people viewed this event sessions and the numbers continue to increase since we still have it posted as well. And the recordings are always available on our website. We have hosted over 10,000 virtual programs with 182,000 live attendees with tens of thousands more viewing uh, the recorded material when their schedules allowed. We added over 50,000 items, this is just Queens alone, to our digital collection in order to meet the demand of our customers in a virtual world. And our eBooks, e-magazines, and other multimedia circulated nearly 2.1 million times, an amazing number. We remain committed to equitable access to library materials and services through programs such as our always, as you know, chair, mail book, our correctional outreach services, our partnership initiatives with homeless shelters, our homebound customers, the convenience of having libraries materials delivered to their doors. We saw an increase of 100 program registrants in 2020. Uh, of that particular program. In 2020, we mailed over 17,000 items to over 900 homebound customers via the mail book program. Our correctional librarian sent over 600 books to Rikers Island. Uh, between April and May of 2020, uh, QPL distributed over 2,000 items such as board games, writing journals, pens, and other stationary items to over 700 families in six domestic violence shelters in the borough of Queens. Uh, we have mailed 13 boxes of books uh, to veteran shelters uh, serving 255 people. Between October and December 2020, we hosted seven stop mobile library tour throughout Queens informing the public 
about to-go service and virtual programming, registering uh, people for library cards and making Wi-Fi available to 250 people in their communities. To address the digital divide we exas exacerbated by the pandemic, we loaned 475 mobile hotspots to students in 2020 through our ongoing collaboration with the Department of Education, and we're working to secure additional items for the public and need to remain events. I won't read the entire testimony because I know you have a jam-packed schedule, but I just want to say that we have increased, all three of us, our services in so many ways. As you indicated, council members, you were tested. Uh, currently, the Queens Public Library has three testing sites up, Kew Gardens Hills, Leffert, and Windsor Park. Uh, to date, we've had 60,000 people who have come through our doors to be tested, and that number continues to grow. Uh, we have served as a learning lab, and as you indicated, we've done census work. We're just there to serve the public. We've retasked our budget to make sure we have more e-material in place, and we have safety always in mind, both for our great staff, who've been doing this. I'm just happened to be the face in front of you. And the staff has been out in the trenches doing this on a regular basis. And one of the things that all of us have experienced is the adaptability, adaptive, I always said, I'm not gonna say that word, the ability <laughs> to adapt to the changing environment. And that to me has been the most, I think, significant thing on the part of our staff. At this moment, 36 of our libraries are open to the public for to-go services. Since reopening for to-go service in July, we have seen over 800,000 visits. Think about that. During a pandemic, with not even all of our libraries open, we have seen 800,000 visits at our locations and more than 350,000 checkout of books and other physical material with many more on hold. And since December 2020, our to-go locations have allowed people to pick up remote printing, which is also turning out to be a very popular service. So we have been doing a lot, council member. Now the impact of the budget, let me take a second to address that from a Queens perspective. As you indicated, the uh, mayor's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget includes a 1.2 million one-time reduction in the operating subsidy, subsidy during this current fiscal year and a devastating $2.9 million reduction to our fiscal year 2022 operating budget. While no one welcomes any reduction to their operating budget, we understand we times we live in, but as the picture I just painted you, we continue to provide the necessary service and serve as that connective tissue to those who unfortunately may not have someone in their lives. We've been working diligently to minimize the impacts of these cuts. However, the 2.9 million cut for fiscal year 2022 means that our collection budget will be reduced from current levels and we will not have an, all the necessary staff to operate at an optimal pre-pandemic level. As of now, we do not project having to lay off any staff. However, it's very important that the council reauthorize the library's initiative to prevent the loss of additional 3.3 million for the QPL for the next fiscal year. This loss coupled with the administration cuts would equal roughly $6.2 million cut to our fiscal 2022 budget. That would be devastating. We've had to make significant investments to protect our staff with PPE and other material, and we have to continue to plan for that as we open up more and more locations. In addition, you talked about in your introduction, council member and chair, uh, the ability to deal with capital. Uh, this fiscal year, while we did not receive any capital funding from the administration, we are very fortunate and grateful to have received a total of 18.6 million from the council, including 4 million unrestricted funding that allows us to address shortfalls in projects. While the administration has been supportive of libraries, we have not received, as you well know, substantial new funding in the city's fiscal 10 year plan for fiscal year since fiscal year 2016. So every day, council member, we are facing challenges and our libraries continue to adapt. So a true recovery for all starts with strong libraries, as you indicate, and especially in partnership since I see the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs there with our cultural institutions. We're the backbone, the lifeblood, the energy of our great city, and every community in this city needs us more and more. Thanks to your leadership, we continue to serve, but the challenges will be great as we move into the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for the incredible work, uh, you and obviously all of your team members and uh, the good and wonderful staff of the Queens Public Library do for the people of Queens. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
We will now hear from Ms. Linda E. Johnson, President CEO of Brooklyn Public Library, followed by Tony Marks, President CEO of New York Public Library. Ms. Johnson, please, when you're ready. You can't speak, Linda? Uh-oh, can we unmute Linda Johnson? There you go. There we go. Thank you, everybody. Um, in particular, um, to my colleague, Dennis Walcott, whose testimony I could have given myself, and a particular congratulations before I thank everybody uh, on the committee and in the city and the administration. Um, Chairman Van Bramer, congratulations on having crossed the break-even line more years uh, at these hearings as an elected official than as a library <laughs> advocate. That's really saying something. Um, yes. I didn't think I would ever miss so much these opportunities for all of us to be together in the chamber. I miss the painting of George Washington and of course the company of all, your of all you fine folks um, but uh, for the time being, uh, this will have to do. And so it is with deep gratitude to Speaker Johnson, Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, you Chairman Van Bramer, uh, uh, Finance Chairman Drum, uh, and uh, Lori Cumbo from uh, Brooklyn, Majority Leader, and uh, uh, welcome to uh, Council Member uh, Diaz as well, one of ours. And thank you to the uh, Brooklyn delegation and the entire city council for supporting New York City's libraries. We deeply appreciate your efforts to ensure that Brooklyn Public Library can continue to serve the 2.6 million residents of our borough. Our patrons who range from infants to older adults have relied on us through the many months of the pandemic and they will continue to rely on us as they rebuild their lives in its wake whether they are seeking trusted vaccine information, improving their resumes or learning to read. In turn, we rely upon the city's support and we urge you to maintain the council's $3.3 million investment in Brooklyn Public Library from last year and to reject the proposed $2.85 million cut in the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget. All told, more than $6 million of our operating funds are at stake. We understand the daunting financial challenges that the city faces, and we have absorbed a peg of $1.2 million in the current fiscal year. But a $6 million loss combined with slashed state funding, reduced private revenue, and increased pandemic-related expenses would force us to leave staff positions unfilled and reduce service levels, which would impede our ability to meet the needs of our patrons at a critical juncture. I admit, year after year, I claim it's never been more important to support the work of libraries, which has always been true. But, and I think you'll all agree, never more so uh, than now. Um, I feel a little like the, you know, uh, the girl who cried wolf, but we truly are at a juncture here. And I know that you all recognize the um, perilous nature of this moment. Public libraries are well positioned to help New Yorkers build their lives and reconnect to their communities. If there is one thing we've proven this year, it's that we are capable of rapidly adapting to meet the needs of our patrons. Nearly a year ago, when our city went into lockdown, Brooklyn Public Library pivoted on every front. We made it easier for Brooklynites to get digital library cards and expanded our digital collection to keep pace with soaring e-checkouts. Our staff began producing virtual programs nearly overnight. To date, we have offered more than 7,000 high quality free virtual programs for nearly 1 million attendees from personalized job assistance to homework help to grief support groups. Just last week, NPR featured our children's librarian, Tenzing Zalsag, whose, whose Tibetan English story times have attracted more than 20,000 viewers at a time, far more obviously than we could have ever fit into uh, Tenzing's Williamsburg branch. Despite all the challenges of 2020, our program attendance surpassed our pre-pandemic record. For those unfamiliar with virtual platforms, 
our libraries, our librarians provided one on one phone training. One older adult wrote, quote, after six months of being alone, your wonderful classes came to me. I again began to feel that I am still a person able to create, learn, and interact socially with a new group of understanding people. And for the millions of thousands of Brooklynites with insufficient broadband access at home, we launched the Brooklyn Reach Project, installing antennas on our rooftops to extend a reliable, unlimited Wi-Fi signal 300 feet in every direction. We started with the highest need neighborhoods and will soon uh, have antennas on 53 branches across the borough. As the weather warms, we will introduce outdoor seating at several branches and expand our laptop loan program. We are also eager to pilot outdoor book browsing and resume uh, outdoor program and resume outdoor programming. Our outdoor programs in the fall of 2020 were a resounding success. Open Air Ask a Tech Sessions provided free tech assistance to patrons adapting to new technology. University Open Air offered free classes in Prospect Park, and our Open Streets Initiative at Macon Library in Bedford-Stuyvesant offered story time and other literacy programs for children and their caregivers. We began welcoming patrons back to our libraries last July in tandem with New York Public Library and Queens Public Library, following the recommendations and guidelines of public health officials. Having reconfigured our workspaces and implemented new cleaning, ventilation, PPE, and workspace distancing protocols, all of our branches, not currently under construction or serving as learning labs, are open to the public in limited capacity. A total of 48 branches are now offering grab and go lobby service. Patrons can pick up library books, art supplies, tax forms, and more. And we are also on demand, we are also offering on demand printing at 10 branches. Whenever it is safe to progress to the next phase of reopening, we will welcome our patrons back for limited computer access and in-branch browsing, as well as appointment-based services. We are not simply waiting for the pandemic to end. We are actively helping the city fight COVID-19, as we have been for much of the last year. In partnership with New York City Test and Trace Corps, Brooklyn Public Library branches have served as PPE distribution and pop-up testing sites. Since August, our librarians and staff have distributed more than 250,000 masks and connected over 44,000 people with accurate information about testing, vaccine safety, and insurance coverage. And they are also helping priority populations secure vaccine appointments. We are cautiously hopeful that as more and more New Yorkers are vaccinated, we will be able to welcome them fully back into their local libraries. Many patrons have expressed their eagerness to spend more time in their branch, to find new books, use, use our technology, have space to work or meet their neighbors. One family wrote, and I quote, we can't wait to be back in our neighborhood library on a normal basis. Another quote, Thank you for being a beacon within our community during this challenging year. My family cannot wait to spend time inside our local branch again. We expect demand to grow with the expansion of service and that in-person full service hours will require intensive staffing. A reduction of $6 million in fiscal year 2022 would jeopardize our service position at the very moment our patrons hope to spend time inside their local branches once again. Likewise, I am afraid that just as we can safely and fully reopen our buildings, we will be forced to contend with closures due to failing heating and cooling systems and leaking roofs. Last year, as every year, I came before you with the same dismal report over 1 million square feet of city owned facilities without adequate funding to maintain them. Though we received no capital funds from the administration in fiscal year 2021, we were able to keep going because of the funding allocated by the council. This year, we again submitted a 10 year capital plan proposal. 
Given the pandemic, we scaled our submission back to $198 million over 10 years for the uh, most urgent infrastructure upgrades, three sorely needed branch overhauls, and funding to cover $40 million in shortfalls in fiscal year 2022 alone. To our great disappointment, our proposal was not accepted. It is indefensible to refuse the long-term funding necessary to maintain the public libraries our patrons rely on. Our system faces millions of dollars in shortfalls on existing projects. The cost of projects stalled by the pandemic is steadily growing, and we are struggling to restart priority renovation projects that have long languished. With the city's help in recent years, Brooklyn Public Library has been able to revitalize select branches, but we still shoulder approximately $250 million in deferred maintenance. The lack of any new capital funding from the administration means we must attend only to the most critical projects without addressing countless infrastructure needs and preventative work. Year after year, I'm forced to come to you hat in hand, I should say hard hat in hand, for limited capital dollars to determine which projects advance and which stall. It is irresponsible, it is inefficient, and it is unfair to our overburdened communities. I implore you to fund libraries capital plans for the coming year and beyond. Dipping into our operating budget to solve urgent capital demands will have dire consequences for public service, which in turn have dire consequences for our city. In order for the people to recover from the pandemic, all the suffering it has wrought and all the inequities it has laid bare, they need spaces and public resources. Public libraries are trusted by every generation located in every neighborhood and serve absolutely everyone. We are uniquely positioned to help New York recover and to rebuild a more democratic, more cohesive city. I urge you to preserve this work and to, so to support this work and to preserve our budget. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And let me just say um, a hard hat in hand, uh, maybe one of your uh, wittiest pieces of testimony in the several years that we've worked together. But to drive home the seriousness of the point, you know, we will, we will come out of this and uh and people will flock to our public libraries more than ever right because the need for all those programs and services and information will always exist but the but the almost desperate need to reconnect with neighbors and other people um and to simply be in those spaces that we all loved uh, for so long but that we couldn't access certainly not in the way that we traditionally did People are going to be um, driving um, uh, into their libraries in unprecedented number. And I don't mean driving in cars necessarily, but just uh, they'll be voting with their feet. And so the physical plants, the actual libraries have to be kept up. They have to be maintained. They have to be repaired. They have to be rebuilt. Uh, we need new uh uh, and better all the time. And so I just want to, you know, hammer home the point that not funding libraries in, in capital is a, a dereliction of duty, in my opinion. Um, we absolutely need this administration to recognize that a just recovery and a recovery that is forward thinking and forward looking into the future has to include our public libraries being adequately funded in the 10 year capital plan because, because the, the numbers of folks going in, right in the industry, we call it gate count, but the number of people who are gonna be coming into our libraries is gonna just go off the charts, I believe, into the future. Um, people are really, really going to want that connection. Those wonderful programs in your auditoriums and and the the reading times. Everyone's going to want that when it's safe to do so, and I certainly hope it will be safe to do so. Um, 
you know, maybe the end of this year or the beginning of next year, whenever it is, uh, folks are going to come back and, and they're going to need the libraries in a state of good uh, repair. Uh, and, and so I just want to thank you, Linda, for making that point um, so powerfully, but I want to amplify it uh, from our perspective at the city council that the administration must step up. Um, it is absolutely unacceptable to refuse that request on the part of our systems uh, to be uh, meaningfully <laughs> included in, in the city's 10-year capital plan and, and in, in, in the city of New York's planning for the future. So uh, uh, that's my soapbox for a moment, but uh, Tony Marks, I think you are ready, willing, and able to speak. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> well, first, thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be um, following uh, my uh, witty and eloquent colleagues, Linda and Dennis, and uh, to hear about the great work that uh, that's happening in Brooklyn and Queens. Um, thank you, and Tony. Before you, Tony, before you go further, I just looked at the, the boxes in my screen and see Majority Leader Lori Cumbo uh, is with us. So I want to. Uh, recognize her um, and the uh, entire committee is here. So thank you very much. Sorry, well, Tony. No, no, I want to thank you uh, uh, for your amazing service. Uh, 23 years of doing these. Uh, I think that qualifies for uh, for some kind of bed, uh, some kind of an award um, and certainly our gratitude um, uh, to you, to Speaker Johnson, uh, to uh, the majority leader, uh, to all the members of the committee. Um, thank you for all of your amazing work and support of libraries uh, and for all of your work and support of New York in this incredibly difficult um, time. It was also a pleasure to hear from the uh, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. And I just wanna shout out, you know, for, you know, we've all been locked up for way too long and the, you know, being able to get back into the museums and the cultural institutions and the role that they've played throughout this and keeping our spirit up is really been uh, astonishing. So thank you uh, to our, our, uh, our sisters and brothers uh, in the culturals. Um, so as has already been said, it's been now almost exactly a year since we suspended services. It's just incredible, but in this period, in this extraordinary year, uh, amid this crisis, we've maintained our commitment to equitable and accessible service by quickly, astonishingly pivoting to digital platforms and remote offerings, partnering with the city on initiatives to manage the impact of the pandemic and moving forward with capital projects. All of that is only possible because of our amazing staff, just a few of whom are here with us. Uh, the senior leadership and throughout the front line, our colleagues at DC 37, I see Val is here. Shout out to the amazing work of, of, of everyone who's made it possible to continue. And, um, and now we face the challenge of maintaining our digital offerings and growing them because we've learned how pivotal, they, how essential they are. Continuing to expand our footprint for all the reasons that you all have described as people are eager to come back and restoring our physical services to help New Yorkers recover from this crisis. Um, the New York Public Library is currently open. Um, we opened, uh, we've been open effectively one way or the other throughout as has been heard from our, uh, our, our sister institutions. We opened again in July with all the various um, requirements for being safe um, and our track record on that. I think across the three library systems has been nothing short of remarkable, perhaps miraculous. Um, the, uh, uh, we are now at 53 locations with Grab and Go together with the Andrew High School Braille and Talking Book Library. We're moving forward with capital projects. We have moved forward. Roosevelt Island opened for Grab and Go on January 25th. Uh, the Inwood temporary space on the same, on the same day. We remained uh, willing throughout to reevaluate our opening plans to make sure that we would adjust to keep everyone safe. Um, and we continue to move forward. That's all sort of, and, and that enabled us to shift fundamentally to uh, Pivotal. There was a period when we talked about the library being only, uh, sorry, digital. Um, 
Our digital library cards, we gave 100, we had issued 124,000 new library cards, 5.2 million digital checkouts, 5.2 million digital checkouts. Um, simply e signups of our uh, ebook app and e checkouts are up 60 and 40% respectively. Our community resource pages provided information, crucial information on wellness, housing, food security, Tech Connect continued to train people for the essential skills in the digital world. Uh, online job training, one-on-one -on -one coaching for interviews, resumes, cover letters, all of that continued. On the research library side, we established Scan and Deliver. So you could order up whatever you need from our really uh, you know, unbelievable research collections. 14,000 of those scans and delivers, virtual consultations with researchers, who are the lifeblood of so much of the creative community in New York that needs to continue to be strong for us to be able to rebound. We've had 2.8 million database items uh, taken from, uh, again, for the first time, you don't have to come in, you can do it uh, from home. That's been amazing. We recognize that, that not everyone is capable um, for reasons that are not their fault of uh, using our digital offerings. We re even throughout, even with the 53 branches, we also um, we established a new shelf help program so that we could you could order up sets of books based on, say, your kids interests. If you're not expert uh, at finding that collection, we'll put a collection for you. Telephone story time, 35,000 summer reading book kits distributed and to help people with access. We left our Wi-Fi on. I think the three systems together, there were days in which we had a thousand people walking through a pandemic to sit outside in the cold to be able to go to school or do their work. I hope I don't need to repeat that. that there are more, one to two million New Yorkers in this situation. You've heard me before, it is way past time for us to find a systemic solution. Meanwhile, Hotspot continues, as you've heard from our, our peer institutions, um, and, and we'll keep going until we find a solution. We're honored to have partnered with the city and so many important civic initiatives from the census to, to voting registration. Um, in the crisis uh, of uh, or the, the recognized ongoing 400 year crisis of race relations in this country, uh, the Schomburg uh, stepped up with uh, its amazing Black uh, Liberation Reading List, 35,000 checkouts. We worked with the city, not just at the beginning, the iPads through DOE, but COVID testing sites, cooling centers, learning labs, polling sites. And we are now in the process of preparing a voter education program for the current year. I know this is across the three systems to help people prepare for voting and might I add, to help some of us who need help understanding rank voting and how it works. I know I'm alone on the call and understanding, you know, uh, in my, my, my queries on that. Um, you've already heard from my colleagues, the budget cuts that have been proposed, or the if we don't get the restorations that we need from you, um, that we will simply not be able to meet the pent up needs of our community. They are going to come back to us. They're eager to come back to us physically. We can't let go of what we're doing virtually. We can't, we have to have the physical structures ready. The things that we will have to start cutting will significantly hurt our ability to meet the public's need at this crucial, crucial moment. And it isn't just operating, as you've heard, it's also capital. Uh, our, our projects are now all restarting, and that includes five Carnegie's, complete redo, Melrose, Fort Washington, 125th Street, St. Hunts, uh, St. Hunts, Hunts Point, and uh, Port Richmond. The Inwood construction is about to be underway. New Amsterdam's just been completed, and Roosevelt Island, as you heard. Um, all of these are aimed at maintaining and renovating our rapidly aging buildings. I know the feeling. Um, only possible through, uh, through sustained funding. The, um, our new, we have submitted requests for $427 million 
Uh, and we would like to do complete renovations at Hudson Park, Edenwald, West New Brighton, Francis Martin, Spiton Dival, County Cullen, as well as a variety of state of good repair efforts, uh, HVAC, ADA, et cetera. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we know that this pandemic, perhaps uniquely, I certainly in my lifetime, has not impacted everyone the same. It has been terrifying and terrible for health and social economic reasons, all the reasons that the cultural commissioner went through. Um, but it has been concentrated in an unprecedented way on the bottom 20, 25% of the economy and the, and the city, and in particular, our citizens of color. It has been like nothing else, right? It says it's not like 2007 to nine, right? It's not where everybody more or less took some hits. Obviously, people who were more vulnerable felt those much more powerfully then. Now, the hit is completely you know, concentrated on the people who are least able to withstand that additional hit, who we have not served as a society adequately up till now for all of our efforts. And now we've seen it shown to us in ways that are just heartbreaking uh, amongst our citizens. So we know that as we, that the, the recovery is going to be so hard, especially hard for these folks who borne the brunt, really borne the brunt and been the essential workers, been the essential New Yorkers throughout. We know that we have to continue our virtual offerings, research, consultations, digitized material, eBooks, programs, but we know that the physical offerings, the physical coming together, the physical learning together, being together, respecting each other has to return, will return. And for those folks who have been most hit, that will be crucial because those are also the folks who are suffering from the digital divide and all of the other hits that they've seen. So we're gonna focus, we're all gonna focus we're gonna use outdoor space. We're gonna, we know that this summer, it's not just summer slide, it's a year slide that we have to deal with. I mean, you know, that your head wants to explode when you think about, you know, how much we have to help folks catch up. Um, so we're gonna be focused on that. I know everyone in the city is gonna be focused on that. We will, um, we, we have been able to absorb the current year's peg and loss of revenues. We're not, we understand reality and we're not being piggy here. We are being clear. We need the restoration. We need to not be cut if we're going to be able to meet the pent up crucial demands because we are the pivotal institutions to do that in the city as Linda and Dennis so eloquently described. Finally, Mr. Chairman, if I can say, we have prioritized our staff and the public's health above all else, and we've been able to do that while meeting the public's need in really amazing and innovative and, and, and expanded ways. But there is no way to eliminate the risk of infection to the hundreds that work in our branches, our frontline workers, and all their colleagues all of us who are committed to the library's mission, we believe that library workers should be prioritized as soon as possible for vaccine eligibility so that we can continue our crucial work and not put our colleagues or ourselves or our loved ones at risk. As the budget process moves ahead, we look forward to working with this council and the administration as always to ensure that we adapt that we continue to innovate, that we hold our investments and our innovations that we've learned from, our expanded opportunities, and restore our physical offerings. All of that is essential for us to serve all New Yorkers and to help this city's strong and equitable recovery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Tony, and thank you to all three of our uh, presidents and CEOs of our three systems. And before I go back to Commissioner Casals, uh, for a moment, I, I just want to say 
And I do like the fact that all four of you are sort of here now testifying together because uh, there are uh, uh, so many ways in which you all are connected, um, the library systems and our cultural community uh, and, and uh, organizations. But you know, Tony, you mentioned equity um, and and uh, access, and and you know, the 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 world is rightly focused on equity and justice, and um, and how the pandemic has disproportionately affected Black and Brown communities, and so many institutions are now uh, talking about these issues. Um, and and seeking to make their organizations more uh, equitable, just, representative, and uh, trying to meet the moments that we find ourselves in. Uh, and libraries certainly have their work to do, but I, I, I do genuinely believe that because libraries <clears throat> are in every community and always have been, because libraries are free and uh, open to all, and always have been, uh, because libraries, um, in in and uh, and a long time ago, did this work, sought to make sure that immigrants um, coming to this city knew that their public libraries were a place of of, of refuge. Right, it, that libraries were always a safe haven, no questions asked. Come to the library, uh, there are programs and services um, here. Uh, this is a safe space. Um, so when you talk about that, Tony, I think about this moment and where so many uh, people uh, are jobless, um, so many people are on lines at food pantries uh, in virtually every neighborhood in the city of New York. Certainly I see uh, a block and a half long line um, uh, on my block, uh, and uh, because we have a very big food pantry here in Sunnyside Gardens, and you know, the libraries are needed more than ever, and and very shortly, I hope, um, folks will be able to come back in, and and you're going to need to be there for them, right? Uh, libraries are going to need to be able to open. Uh, to have all those programs and services, to have the staffing necessary, uh, to have the the buildings in in the state of good repair, and and to be able to do the work that is about helping those most in need, right? Those who have been left out and left behind. Our public libraries are always there um, for everyone, and so incredibly important that we uh, maintain your funding and your budgets uh, in this most challenging of times. But I wanna do uh, return to Commissioner Casals um, uh, uh, briefly to talk a little bit about your funding situation as well. Um, everyone knows how much I love <laughs> the cultural community and how hard we have fought for funding uh, to the Department of Cultural Affairs and in particular city council cultural initiatives. And we've done some, some incredible work over the last several years, uh, reaching an all time record high in funding at the Department of Cultural Affairs. Obviously uh, the pandemic has changed some of those factors, uh, including a cut of $633,000 in FY21 and a $4.7 million uh, uh, cut, proposed cut in fiscal 22 um, that uh, reduces Create NYC funding, uh, CDF and energy grants. Obviously, I am equally disappointed to see cuts to our cultural community at a time when funding is needed most. And uh, while culture never closed um, and, and our cultural community have done amazing work in, in keeping the arts alive. It is a sector, as you know, Commissioner Crisales, uh, particularly in the performing arts, where they were the first to close and, and seemingly going to be the last to open in a way that is sustainable. So it is incredibly important that we um, 
meet the moment. So can you talk a little bit about the funding reductions that the department has seen and is facing and what those impacts will be on our community? Of course, um, Chair. Um, and first, you know, I, I feel a little silly um, to remind this to you after um, so many years um, doing this work. But, uh, you know, this is the beginning of a budget conversation. Um, it's not unlike, um, you know, to have um, numbers like this um, at, at this point, you know, preliminary budget. And, and again, um, given the, uh, the uh, context in which we are living, a 3% cut. Um, it's not extremely significant, and I'm confident that, you know, working with the council, we're going to arrive to um, a, a very successful um, budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs. In particular, those cuts had to do with uh, savings that we were asked to do this year, um, the PEG, and we um, decided at the Department of Cultural Affairs to do two things in terms of how those savings were going to happen. One is we try to take as much savings from the operations of the agency. And then when we were forced to look at um, cutting funding for our cultural organizations, um, we very clearly decided that this was not the year in which we can do that. We wanted to keep as much as we could and we did. Uh, the integrity of the funds that we were already promising to um, cultural organizations. And so we transfer some of those savings to um, FY22. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And yes, while it is uh, early in the process, or we're just formally kicking off the process uh, today for our uh, culturals and libraries in particular, um, it is always better to uh, start from a place of uh, uh, not having cuts, right? Uh, because we're always sort of behind uh, if we're fighting for restoration, as opposed to being in a place where we could fight for additional uh, programs and uh, services and funding and uh, incredibly important. Uh, so I, I know that, uh, you know, the open culture program is uh, underway. And we have seen some uh, exciting numbers in the first seven days of the program being alive in terms of applications. Uh, we were uh, told that there are uh, at least uh, 60 um, different uh, organizations that have applied in the first seven days with uh, over 150 performances uh, planned across the city. That is just in the first um, seven days. I'm sure that number has already moved up uh, as more and more groups come to it. So. Uh, your thoughts on both open culture, but also getting our cultural community um, working again and, and how we all can think out of the box and, and get folks working, get artists working. Um, because as you note, I think in your testimony, uh, so many uh, people in the cultural community have lost their jobs. Yes, and, and to, for that, I have to give uh, credit to you. I think I believe you were um, just sitting in one of the open restaurants uh, last summer when you thought that, you know, what can we do this for arts and culture? And really um, brought all, all of us together to think, yeah. you know, as you said, outside the box, you know, how we can make this happen. Um, I'm really humbled by, you know, the uh, perception of, of the program, um, you know, and also um, it tells us how much, um, needed and um, it is in terms of you know creating jobs for our artists but also give the opportunity of cultural organizations to do the work that they love to do which is serving new yorkers um as um, probably you know um, um the state is relaxing the guidelines for outdoor performances and um, we're seeing now that um double the amount of people that you could um bring together in an outdoor performance to 200 people and we're just continue to, to have conversations um, with the state and with the cultural organizations to continue to see how we can move forward as uh, vaccination and you know, things are, are getting better and really look forward again to work uh, with the council to um, figure out a, a budget that's going to um, continue to help the sector um, in such an um, important year, um, which would be hopefully the year of the comeback. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I have more questions, but I wanna open it up to council member questions. 
I see Councilmember Joni uh, has his hand raised. Uh, ask him if he would like to uh, speak and any other council members uh, who are here if they want to raise their hand or make known that they would like to uh, ask a question. Councilmember Joni, are you prepared to ask a question? Okay. We will. Okay, I am. Thank you. There you are. Okay. Me. Thank you, Go Chair. Ahead, thank, you. thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for this very important uh, hearing on uh, public libraries and cultural affairs and the future of our libraries and uh, DCLA. Uh, my specific question, uh, and you probably recall this from last year and the previous year's chair, is to public libraries regarding Westchester Square Branch. This is going on year 10, I believe, that the project has been funded. Um, I'm hopeful that I can get an answer and a recommitment uh, to uh, having that branch finally acquired and built. It's a 12,000 square foot, much we needed for the area. Um, I believe it was 29.4 million um, that was allocated to the uh, funding of acquiring and building out. Can we have an update on this? <laughs> there you go, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so, of course, we, uh, we share your concern about this. This project and its need has been going on way too long uh, before I arrived at the library, uh, before you know, all of us have put in additional efforts. The, because it's taken so long, the price continues to go up. We've, you know, folks have been incredibly generous in supporting that. I think we are currently on, we, we have done, the library has done everything that we need to do on our side. I think the holdup now, as I recall, is the city uh, purchasing uh, formerly the adjacent property where we'll be building. Um, and we're continuing to work with the city and we're eager to get Westchester Square, the, you know, the great new library that it has way too long deserved. Uh, we're, Councilman, as frustrated as you are. Th thank you, President Marks. But if, in our last hearing last year, when this was brought up, I was assured within a short period of time, the acquisition would be completed, the property would transfer this to the city of New York and then we begin the process of um, construction. That was the last, and I, it was a strong assurance that we're going to make this happen. Again, I, Councilman, I think it's fair to say we have done and continue to do during this year everything we can to make this happen, working assiduously, and I, I not sure I have a good answer for why the city hasn't moved on the one remaining piece to get this thing moving and done. It's, you know, as I say, been, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It is ridiculous, President Marks. Is there anything that you can, that you can assure my constituents and me that this will finally be done? That the, I mean, we've done everything. And without acquiring the property, there is no next step. You have done everything and your predecessors have done everything. My predecessors have done everything. It's, um, we, you have my word that we will say this, this year, the coming year, we will get this done one way or another. It's just ridiculous. We'll get the city off the hook and, and, and purchasing or we will find a way forward. Um, but this, you know, I agree, cannot continue. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, President Marks. And I think we've just, we're replaying the last several years hearings on the budget and new properties. I feel the same, you know, it's the same frustration we also have with, uh, you know, wh when we're trying to do projects with DDC. It's, you know, there are these structural issues that we keep running into and they keep not only frustrating what the citizens need in terms of a, a great new library, but they end up costing the citizens of New York, in this case, two, three times what it should cost because of the delays and how that keeps adding up. It's outrageous, in my opinion. I, you know, the word outrageous, I think, doesn't really underscore. This is more pathetic than anything else. And um, I'm just sad that we continue to have these conversations. And ultimately, it's a delay. Of course, everyone much money, much more in the form of time and money and limited resources. 
I agree. Uh, let let us uh, let me talk with my folks. And see how we can do. You know, even more to push. And I will come back to you personally. You have my that, word. That would be great. Thank you, President. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Thank you, Council Member Jonai. Um, I wanted to uh, go back to uh, something when uh, President Sia Walcott mentioned that uh, 800,000 Queens residents have uh, gone to one of the uh, libraries. I believe I got that right, Dennis, right? 800,000 uh, visits during a pandemic to one of uh, the Queens Library locations that are open for grab and go. Um, that's a staggering number, uh, absolutely stag staggering number in terms of the need. So I wonder a, if Dennis can talk a little bit more about that, but also the other systems, what are your comparable numbers? Because I'm trying to get at this incredible uh, need and desire for public library service that even in a pandemic, nearly a million people uh, would in person go to uh, their, their local Queens Library um, that was open, obviously. And I'm sure New York and Brooklyn have um, similar stories to tell. So a couple of things. One, they have been throughout where some are concentrated, like Bayside, before we turned Kew Gardens Hills into a testing site, Kew Gardens Hills. Once we started unfolding more and more of the libraries for grab and go, Jackson Heights, Forest Hills, and we have seen the numbers just continue to increase. That's one aspect. Tony touched on another aspect in that our Wi-Fi expansion, and Linda also talked about, as far as what we're doing for the community as far as Wi-Fi capacity as well. People will come outside in the brutal cold to take advantage, to sit in their cars, to come up personally. And like Linda and Tony, we have Wi-Fi extender programs as well, where our Wi-Fi network goes out to roughly 150 yards and at a number of our libraries. So they're taking advantage of the services in that way as well. So we're seeing it now that we've also instituted uh, the remote uh, printing services. That's extremely popular. I mean, people are taking advantage of the remote printing as well. And so we have remote printing available at all of our uh, grab and go libraries. And then we have our fulfillment centers as well. So you see a number of programmatic activities that are being maintained in a safe way, but people are coming in for books, materials, for printing, for Wi-Fi, and basic core services that we're providing. Tony, Linda, anything to add? Linda is muted. Please unmute President and CEO Johnson. Thank Frustrating. Um, yeah, of course, our numbers are comparable uh, to what Dennis has spoken of. Uh, the, the astonishing thing is that if you look uh, calendar year over calendar year, um, we've had an uptick by 10% in program attendance year over year. Um, and that just... Uh, sort of sends home the fact that, uh, you know, because so much of what we're doing is virtual, people are taking advantage in numbers that we would never be able to achieve otherwise. Um, having said that, the real issue, of course, is those that the digit on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, and that's, of course, the most heartbreaking thing and something that um, we are trying to highlight uh, and sharpen people's focus uh, because I think it's never been more deeply understood than when you're trying to uh, get your child educated and you don't have sufficient broadband at home to do that. Um, and, but for those people who, uh, who are relying on our physical spaces, um, we're doing, as I explained in my testimony, everything we can. Uh, we've had since July, uh, close to 400,000 visits um, we've had, uh, uh, we have uh, tons of material in circulation um, and also, uh, you know, making huge efforts to bring it all back. Um, the material that was out uh, when we closed, as well as the material that's um, being uh, reserved while we're in a grab and go uh, phase, but checkouts have been well over 2 million uh, during the pandemic. I think my colleagues have said it all. I mean, I think, you know, what we see, uh, we've all talked about this, the, the sort of concentration of impact, of adverse impact of this whole experience. 
has doubled down on it precisely the people, for instance, who don't have digital, you know, who are on the wrong side of the digital divide. You know, and as Linda just said, you know, you can't even go to school or go do your job or look for a job or look for a school or, you know, anything. Um, you know, we're so past the time to fix this. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, given the efforts of the libraries, given everyone's attention on this, as Linda just and Dennis just described, that, you know, this is no longer avoidable as a serious public policy problem. Look, let me be clear, the library, uh, uh, maybe this will help for an analogy. The library was not in the electricity business a century ago, but we sure had an interest in people getting electricity into their homes, including poor people, so that they could read, right? We have a similar interest now in finding a way to get every New Yorker connectivity. There needs to be a utility level of basic service for free or close to it in this city, period. And I'm tired of this subject. And after this last year, I'm fit to be tied beyond tired. I mean, I, I don't think it's overstating. This is the civil rights issue of this era. Certainly makes addressing any of the other issues. Right, impossible. you can't even begin to talk about everything else. That's exactly right. Right. Thank you, um, uh, Tony, Linda, and Dennis. Um, I wanted to go back to Commissioner Casals um, uh, one more time. And uh, obviously your uh, uh, relationship within the budget situation is slightly different than obviously the presidents and CEOs of our library systems um, who uh, uh, are, are not a part of the administration. Uh, so they uh, uh, engage in a level of advocacy that they, they are engaged in. Uh, your role, of course, is uh, even trickier uh, in some ways, but it is very important, as you know, Commissioner, for the uh, cultural uh, community to know that you're in there, um, you know, fighting for uh, every dollar uh, for for this community as the commissioner, um, who yes is appointed by uh, the mayor and is a part of this administration, but who is also uh, a, a leading advocate, right, for for the people that you and I both represent. Obviously, I am able to um, maybe say things a little bit differently and more um, uh, pointedly, but talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, without uh, uh, speaking out of, uh, out of term, but your, your advocacy within the, uh, within the administration uh, and, and how that's going and, and speak to uh, the, the degree and the, and the level of your fight um, on behalf of culturals. Um, be before I answer that question, and I really need to say this, um, as you were spending 23 years, you know, in hearings, I spent almost as many years, you know, in public programming, and I never saw um, somebody that could moderate such different audiences in a conversation as you're doing now. Congratulations to that. That's a skill that nobody learns in school. Um, you know, I must say that, uh, well, you know, I can, and you know me, I come to this position with an advocate, you know, sort of spirit. Um, I must tell you, and it's very clear, hopefully to everyone, that uh, this is not an administration that in which you need to fight for arts and culture. This is uh, an administration that believes in arts and culture. As you mentioned before, I'm working with a council we had reached in the last eight years, um, 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 historic funding for arts and culture and for the agency, even in a year like last year in which um, nobody knew what was going to happen. There was a commitment uh, to arts and culture with a very slight um, 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 cut to the budget. Um, um, all things considered, I see that budget as a very successful budget. And, and again, um, we, in conversations I have, um, you know, across the, um, across the um, administration, um, we cont everybody continues to understand that the New York cannot recover if the arts and culture sector um, it, is not recovered. So they're um, one and, and, and two um, together in so many ways. And, and it's not only about the economic development that um, the sector provides to the city, as um, our uh, colleagues at the uh, libraries understand so well, it's also about the positive social impact that uh, arts and culture can have in, in the neighborhood and in a community. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner, Consa uh, Commissioner Casals. Um, I, uh, of course, for your, your history and uh, passion for the arts and, and for your genuine belief that, uh, that we are both responsible to, accountable to the constituency that we represent and fight for, which is uh, all things culture and the arts in the city of New York. And I know you'll be in there uh, fighting uh, as hard as you can, uh, as I will be uh, in my position fighting. Also, thank you for the compliments on my moderating this panel, which is a little bit more interesting than we had intended it to be, uh, a little bit more, uh, but we, we, we move with the times and, and we're, we have dexterity here. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's also great because I, uh, um, uh, 23 years into this, uh, uh, have a great deal of uh, affinity for the four of you, but also um, even more importantly for the people that you all represent. And, and so, and I deeply believe that uh, libraries, culture and the arts together um, form the heart of who we are. Um, it's, uh, and, and, uh, and that's where hope lies in, in this moment in particular um, is people coming together, um, able to share ideas and, uh, and express themselves. And, and no one does it better than libraries and, and, and the arts. Um, so it is, uh, it, is, it is great fun. And uh, I was just thinking, I obviously uh, do not yet know where I will be next March um, and in what position, but um, regardless, I may just show up to this hearing anyway, just because I, I, this is where I am every March for the last 23 years. Uh, so so. I, I just would like to say in this blended uh, hearing that we're having, one of the projects that we've been able to continue during the pandemic, uh, which is terrific, um, is uh, building a branch inside the Brooklyn Children's Museum uh, partnering with Commissioner Gonzalez. And so um, we're very excited that just this week, actually, we opened for grab and go service in that library, in that space, in the Children's Museum, even though the library is not finished yet, as a way of um, broadcasting to the community that this is what's coming uh, and to get people into the habit of uh, moving a couple blocks from where our branch in the neighborhood was to the new location uh, in the museum. We couldn't be more excited about the partnership. That's great. Uh, uh, thank you, Linda, for for that. And I will um, ask if there are any other council members who have questions for the three presidents and CEOs and uh, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, since we are doing this all as one group uh, virtually uh, for the first time. And if there are no other questions from council members, for uh, either the three present CEOs or the commissioner of uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs. We will excuse all four of you as uh, a sort of blended panel as it turned out to be this morning and move on to our uh, public portion of the testimony. Um, and the committee staff can let me know if there are any other council member uh, questions. If no. not, so okay. Far. Questions, Chair. Council okay. member, if I, yes. I would like to take this moment to remind you that if you'd like to pose a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Okay. No question. Seeing. No question. Seeing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna. And so with that, uh, thank you, uh, Dennis Walcott, Tony Marks, Linda Johnson, uh, Commissioner Casals for your testimony, for your advocacy. Obviously, we will um, be following this incredibly closely as we move towards an executive budget uh, and making sure that our public libraries and our uh, culturals are protected, defended, and funded in a way where all of you can continue to do the uh, life-saving work that you do. And I don't say that lightly. Um, I mean that. So uh, thank you all. You're willing to stay uh, and hear as much as you'd like, but we will uh, meet again very soon.
Councilman, and just one, one thing as we leave. Um, I know for all of us, we've never um, had this experience of testifying with a chairman, with any chairman other than yourself. Um, and we are deeply grateful for your leadership. And as I sit here thinking about it, it's hard to imagine uh, what these hearings would be like without you. So um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys soon. We will start the next round. Uh, um, Anna, can I uh, take a two minute break before we go to the next panel? Uh, most certainly, um, while you- <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No. Thank you, I'll be right back. <laughs> I will go over the housekeeping rules for the public testimony portion, please. Um, so now that we have concluded the administration's testimony, we will now turn to public testimony. For members of the public, please note that I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function on Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raised your hand on Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant in arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting a timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Um, so for the first public panel, um, the first public panel uh, in that order would be Sarah, Espanol, Librarian, Queen's Library, followed by Chantelle Johnson, Social Worker, Queen's Library, Christine Zaret, Curator, Queen's Library, and then Jocelyn Atahualpa, Local 1321, DC37, Queen's Library Worker. Miss Sara Espanol, uh, whenever you're ready. And the timing is perfect. Miss Espanol? Okay, uh, since Miss Espanol is not here, we'll circle, circle back. Um, we now will hear from Ms. Chantel Johnson. Ms. Johnson, if you're ready, please. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, um, the, um, Chair Van Bomer um, and fellow committee members. My name is Chantel Johnson and I'm the case manager slash social worker for the Queens Public Library Adult Learner Program. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to represent my program and testify on the mayor's FY 2022 preliminary budget for the free library assistance. So I'm here today to represent my colleagues and clients who rely on our continued services that provide support and connections to community organizations that enhances the quality of their lives. I want to offer a glimpse on how your funding has addressed the needs of the borough's underserved communities and how the people we serve have made the con us cognizant of the difficulties in accessing gainful employment like food, housing, and other needs just to name a few as the pandemic ravaged these communities. Students are enrolling in our adult learning classes. However, they need more support. In order for them to successfully complete their classes, they also need continuous case management assistance and guidance. As we are becoming aware of the increasing and wide ranging needs among our students, we also recognize that to properly address them, additional monetary support is required. Many of my colleagues and I have met these challenges through educating the disadvantaged communities we service on how to advocate for themselves during a period of uncertainty. Our staff has worked tirelessly and stepped into many roles necessary to support our diverse student population. Our staff and students have built a strong rapport with each other and have a high level of trust and comfort. They rely on us to help and have regularly shared, have regularly shared personal vulnerable details of their lives, unfortunately to the point of tears. With your increased support, you can aid us in improving the lives of our clients. We need your help so we can continue to be a beacon of hope during these uncertain times for our customers. 
As I conclude today, I represent the dedicated members of our adult learning program. And I can definitively testify that we have worked hard to keep our virtual library doors open along with our hearts while undergoing the many trials and tribulations of our own lives. Please help us so we can help the communities we serve. We do not want to turn anyone away because our caseloads are way too Time hard. expired. Thank you very much and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Chantel, uh, so much for your work and as someone who did work at the Queens Public Library for 11 years before I got elected, I can certainly tell you that there are a few things as impactful as interacting with the adult learner program uh, and the, uh, the incredible things that I saw uh, happening at uh, the adult learning centers when I um, worked at the Queens Public Library. And obviously since I've been the chair of the committee as well, but um, if people wanna feel good about <laughs> the world, they should visit um, one of these programs and see the work that you and your colleagues do. Um, there, is, uh, there is never uh, a dry eye in the house when you um, hear from folks who have benefited from these programs, been a part of these programs, um, and uh, had their lives changed forever. Um, and sometimes that happens, as you know, when people are in their 60s. Um, you know, when they're in their 70s um, and uh, and they find a program like this and uh, and their lives are are never the same because of people like you um, who do the work. Um, and so I want to say thank you for that. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. We will now hear from Ms. Christine Zaret, curator of Queen's Library, followed by Jocelyn Ataulapa, local in 21. Ms. Zaret, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the City Council members today. I'm Christine Zaret, curator for the Black Heritage Reference Collection at the Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center. After closing our doors in March 2020, staff at the branch jumped into action and moved to virtual programming in April. We essentially adapted any in-person program we could to virtual. We created programs for virtual attendance, including a Good For Your Soul cooking program, an educators meetup, and a Motivational Mondays workshop. Since April, the Langston News Library has hosted a minimum of three programs a week, and attendance remains steady. Curator's Choice programs that I run brought people together to discuss Black history and culture. We also partnered with the Brooklyn Public Library for a special program on African-American spirituals. Programs also included presentations on Black artists, Dave the Potter, and quilts, including Underground Railroad quilts. All this material for Curator's Choice was accessed from the Black Heritage Collection. Also, material from the collection was shared digitally with Baruch College Black Studies classes, including essays, slave narratives, and poetry. The Langston News Library also held all our annual events virtually. Uh, staff took great care, thinking, and planning of our programs for our diverse community. Hispanic Heritage Month contained a series of programs, including cooking series, a health workshop series, dance series, and a craft series. The annual Langston News Literary Arts Festival consisted of poetry readings, author talks, and a theater performance. We also held our 36th annual Kwanzaa celebration um, and held seven events during the last week of December, acknowledging each of the seven principles of Kwanzaa. We also came together as a branch to create and publish a monthly newsletter um, that spotlighted a community member, a live li library staff, a letter from the executive director, programming schedule, poems, and an artist corner feature with a photo from the Langston News Library I'm Art excited. Collection. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> um, you you uh, stopped on a dime there. Um, I did. <laughs> Uh, Can I just add a per personal? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, feel free to to share a few more uh, uh, thoughts if you'd like. Um, if not, um, obviously, Langston Hughes uh, is an incredibly important institution and uh, one of the most special places. In, it is in all of 
Queens. Yeah. It is. And I just want to say, just on a personal note, in putting together my Curator's Choice programs, I put my heart into it. And I spend a lot of time thinking about the, what material to present. And the best part is people do respond and say thank you and say, I didn't know that. So I'm sharing information from the collection. So thank you. And thank you for your time today and continuing to support the Queens Public Library. Thank you, Christine. Thank you so much, Ms. Zaret. We will now hear from Ms. Jocelyn Atalalpa, Local 1321. Whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Should we move on to the next speaker? Um, give me one moment, I'm checking. I know that Ron Barber is speaking on behalf of the right. library locals, is that correct? Um, so for now, we will move on to Ms. Svetlana Negrimovsky. She's a managing librarian at the Brooklyn Public Library, and we'll circle back to those. Who have... um, so Ms. Negrimovsky, please, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, can you please give me like 10 minutes? I just need 10 minutes to prepare. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Um, just yes. Um, next we will hear from Dam. Beck, young adult librarian, Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Ms. Beck? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, had trouble unmuting. Okay. Good. Uh afternoon now. My name is Zama Beck. I'm the Young Adult Librarian at the Mill Basin Branch of Brooklyn Public Library, and I'm here today to speak upon the value of the public library systems to New York City, and thank you to the Cultural Affairs and Library Committee for having me, uh, for allowing me to testify. So I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about what the library means to me personally. I am the quintessential library kid, all grown up. I racked up countless finds on countless books all throughout my childhood. I volunteered at my local branch, the Midwood branch, and even worked there part-time. And I've been working full-time at BPL for like almost three years now. And I think I finally, finally figured out how to articulate what it is that public libraries actually do for New Yorkers. Everything. If asked, we do everything we can to help the people we serve. You need books? We got those in every flavor. You need Wi-Fi? Sure, free to access 24 seven. Need ESOL classes? No problem, we got the best teachers in the game. Need to call your mom after school and let her know where you are? Here's the phone and here's a snack. I wear many hats as a librarian, educator, social worker, community advocate. I'm not gonna lie to you and say that it's easy either, but what makes it a little bit more manageable is the promise of funding. It is the support of the city council and the recognition of the sheer scope of work that we do. The library has been a stabilizing force for me my whole life and I would love to show what it can do for other people. For the past year, we've all heard about how New York is tough, New York is resilient. And I believe these things to be true only because I still have faith in the institutions designed to allow us good quality of life. Our city is what it is because we have public schools, parks, libraries. And more than that, I have faith in the people working in these systems uh, to keep them from faltering, despite budget cuts, lest we let our communities down. City workers are the lifeblood of New York and we are your constituents too. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. And I hope I made an impact. You did. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Damla. Uh, that was terrific. And uh, I agree with you. And I think there are many of us who are 
uh, products of our libraries and who are in the positions uh, that we are because we had access uh, and spent so much time in our libraries as children um, and teenagers and therefore had access to things that, uh, at least in my case, um, you weren't available in the home, right, um, uh, for various reasons. So uh, thank you. Very, very passionate and, uh, uh, and strong testimony. So thank you, Dama. Love hearing from all these library workers. This is great. Thank you so much, Ms. Beck. Um, we will now hear from Mr. Russell Granet, uh, if the ex executive director of the new 42nd Street. Mr. Granet, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you everyone for having now. me today. Great. Uh, I'm going to start with good news. Uh, I'm uh, well, the good news is I'm Russell Granite, I think, and I am the president and CEO of New 42, which is also the new Victory Theater. Um, and we shut our theater down on March 13th. And on Monday, uh, the 16th, uh, we started with online content. And in that first week, we had 25,000 people participating. And I'm happy to report a year later, uh, we're at about 900,000 people. So in a given year where we see 100,000 people live in our theater, and we hope to be back very soon, um, we're most likely gonna hit the million mark. Um, uh, and our goal there is around access and equity. We've always believed the New Victory Theater with its um, subsidized ticket price is about access and equity. So the idea that through this, this very turbulent year, we've been able to reach uh, more people than we ever have in one given year um, is thrilling for us. Um, we've also underwritten all of our education work. So anything at the New Victory that a teacher wants to participate in the five boroughs of New York City, receive all of that programming um, free of charge. And we've made it as easy for educators as possible to participate in the New Victory and in the New 42 projects. Um, we have a program called LabWorks where we are devising work uh, for young people um, solely uh, devised by people of color. Um, largely what's on the stage is for young people and families, although the actors might be um, artists of color, the creative team is oftentimes white. So we are investing heavily in wanting to ensure that everyone's story is told on the new victory stage, not only here, um, but around the world. Um, we were greatly impacted by COVID. We had to shut down all of our theaters, uh, which meant no earned revenue um, from any of our um, uh, real estate. Um, we had um, salaries uh, were reduced, we had layoffs, we had um, job share. Um, we did everything we can to everything we could to hold on people, hold on to people to ensure that they had health insurance. Um, so funding from the council um, is uh, enormous and, and uh, very helpful to us. Um, we would ask that you try and streamline the process so it's a little bit easier uh, to apply uh, and to follow up with the council, but obviously your support has been undoing. I'm Thank expired. You. Great, thank you so much. And uh, just to put a finer point on it, uh, Russ, uh, you are talking about uh, sort of, uh, you know, actually getting the funding that you're allocated, right? In terms of either city council discretionary funding Correct. or CDF, um, in terms of our, our culturals, the, the process is still taking far too long for groups to be able to draw down their funding. Um, yes, uh, that is something that we continue to work on. I know that um, the DCLA um, acknowledges that there's still a lot of work to be done there. And uh, so we are, we are absolutely uh, focused on that uh, issue because um, it, is, it is very important. Um, and thank you for, for the work uh, that you and your organization uh, do um, and we'll and, and I hope, I hope soon you'll be able to welcome people back um, uh, safely, obviously, to, uh, to the theater. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you so very much. Next, we will, have, we will uh, hear from Mr. Barber. Mr. Barber, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chair uh, Jimmy Van Brenner and fellow committee members. Uh, my name is uh, Ronaldo Barber, and I'm here uh, to testify on behalf of the uh, Tri Library. Uh, I want to thank you first and foremost for this opportunity to testify before you in conjunction with my fellow presidents. Um, I want to dedicate this testimony that we are presenting to you today in memory of uh, our beloved Eileen Muller 
uh, who, um, who was the past president of Local 1482 and who passed away uh, last month. Uh, we missed her greatly. She's a great leader uh, and friend. Um, so uh, I want to begin by saying that on March 5th, 2020, we sat at city council chambers to testify about the great work library staff do for everyone with a sense of uh, foreboding. Knowing something on the horizon was fast approaching. 11 days later, the three library system closed their doors. None of us fully understood how this would impact libraries and how we were going to provide services. But we worked it out as we embark upon the one year anniversary of this pandemic that induced the shutdown, we need to take a moment and reflect on library workers' dedication and work. Immediately, the administration staff worked frantically to make sure our libraries were a safe workplace. IT department staff maintained our online infrastructure, boosted our Wi-Fi, maintenance and custodian staff cleaned and maintained our library's building, HR and finance staff provided much needed services, collection development staff greatly expanded our ebook collection, our programs and services department, and public service staff created and offered a myriad of programs, reading advisories, online reference and chat, homework help, adult learning program, job service, workshop stories, and other entertainment. The Feel free to finish up, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Library workers are well aware that these services are inadequate, but that our customers need full library service, books and place to conduct search, job preparedness, technology, safe, clean libraries, entertainment, preschool, and other fundamental programs. Seeing so, you know, our customers are an, all, of all ages and background come through our doors, it is something that all of us miss dearly. We're deeply hoping uh, to uh, return to normalcy in order to meet our customers' needs. However, this may not happen. The budget cuts being discussed will cause library service and staffing levels to revert to those of the 1970s. However, we, we want uh, very, we are very thankful that the city and the administration have been conscientious of the employees and customer safety. Now we need your help, uh, Mr. Chair, and the city council. We need your help in convincing the governor and the mayor that our staff need the vaccine. We need your help funding libraries so we are vaccinated and can open safely. Everyone will have access to all of the library's vital materials, computers, Wi-Fi, printers, programs, and more. We are eager and willing, but we need your help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Ron. I uh, want to uh, say a few things. Number one, I uh, was not aware of Eileen Muller's passing. Uh, and just want to say that I knew her obviously for many years. In, in many different capacities. And uh, she was uh, a terrific uh, leader uh, and fighter on behalf of uh, Brooklyn Public Library workers. So I uh, uh, want to just say that about Eileen. Uh, she was uh, very, very kind to me over the years. Um, also want to just say, yes, clearly public library employees should have uh, immediate ac access to uh, the vaccine, uh, vaccines, and happy to uh, push that, um, uh, you know, in a, in a letter and in a statement to the governor right now, right here, um, public library workers need to be protected. Uh, there is obviously a, a level of public interaction and uh, library workers need to be protected. Um, you are on the front lines and have always been on the front lines um, of public service and in the pandemic, it is incredibly important. Um, and so uh, let me also just say thank you, uh, Ron, and I see uh, John uh, Hislop and I thought I saw Mr. Paul um, uh, as well. Um, our, our presidents of our of our library uh, uh, locals 
um, who are here um, and always, oh, Val Cologne, how could I uh, miss Val Cologne? Um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, how much I care about deeply uh, library employees, uh, library workers, and, um, and how grateful we are uh, that you're able to, uh, to work um, uh, and serve as you always do and always have, but that uh, it is done safely um, and that library workers are uh, the ones at the table, uh, well represented by these locals uh, in making sure that it's done in a way that is safe and equitable um, and fair to, to library uh, workers. So, uh, so thank you, Ron, um, John, Val, and um, uh, Mr. Paul, I see you there um, as well. And uh, I hope I got all the local uh, leaders there. Uh, I, see, I see Lauren Camito, who I assume will be speaking uh, uh, as well, but uh, uh, library workers uh, mean everything to me, and I, more importantly, they mean everything to the city uh, of New York, and um, and so we are one in this fight, uh, Mr. Barber. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Barber. We will now hear from Mr. John Heisler, President of Local 1321, followed by Mr. Valentin Colon, President of Local 1930, and then Leonard Paul, President of Local 374. Mr. Heisler, whenever you're ready, please. Time oh. starts now. Uh, Ron Barber spoke on our behalf. Yep. So, so we're good. All the, all the local presidents have... Um, Ron spoke on our behalf. So Thank you, John. That is my understanding as well, uh, Anna, that uh, the, all the library locals um, combined their incredible forces and spirit and Ron uh, delivered uh, the testimony on behalf of all. Okay. Um, at, that, at this time, if I may take a moment to remind council members that if they have any questions, for the panelists or a particular panelist to please uh, use the raise hand function in Zoom. Okay, I see no questions from council members, so we can move on to the next panel. And the next panel will be uh, Ms. Kelly Kahn, Institutional Development at Guggenheim, followed by Lisa Gold, Executive Director of Asian American Arts Alliance, followed by Kimberly Olson, Executive Director of New York City Arts and Education Roundtable, and then Sheila Lewandowski, Executive Director of Chocolate Factory Feeder. Kelly Kranz, uh, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Apologies. Um, I'm borrowing Kelly's account. My name is Syra Levinson and I'm Deputy Director of Education and Public Engagement at the Guggenheim Museum. One year ago, New York City was beginning to close down due to the pandemic. And in these last 12 months, the country and our city have witnessed profound disruption, change and loss. The impacts of the events of 2020 cannot be overstated. The calls for social justice and racial equity drove much needed conversations around the country and within our own institution. Our work to forge paths towards a more equitable and diverse institution is well underway. We remain committed to fulfilling our promise that all New Yorkers feel welcome at the Guggenheim. In addition to the over a million visitors a year we had pre-pandemic, the Guggenheim has also been offering arts learning opportunities for over 50 years to students in New York City across all five boroughs. We remain committed to our students and recognize that they represent the future of our audience, but also the future of our field. Similar to many New York City museums, the Guggenheim currently has a significant financial obstacle from approximately $12 million of revenue loss as a result of the pandemic this past year. As you know well, in an effort to recruit its own revenue losses associated with COVID-19, the 2021 New York City budget reflects a 70% cut 
cut to arts funding for New York City public schools. These devastating budgetary cuts will directly impact the system's 1.1 million students, leaving many without access to arts instruction and opportunities for self-expression. Through its free programs, the Guggenheim seeks to fill this educational gap offering arts programs to students across the city as we have always done. In addition to the multitude of proven benefits from arts learning, increased self-confidence and self-understanding. I'm inspired. We know that arts funding is essential to the healing of New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Um, we will now hear from Ms. Lisa Gold. Executive Director of Asian American Arts Alliance, followed by Ms. Kimberly Olson. Ms. Gold, whenever you're ready. Time starts Thank now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much to the City Council and the Commissioner for your leadership. Uh, and for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Lisa Gold. I'm the executive director of the Asian American Arts Alliance. We are a 37 year old organization dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts organizations, um, as well as providing a critical voice for the APA or Asian Pacific American community. Um, we have been extremely fortunate over the years to receive funding through the city council and the department of cultural affairs. And it's been like truly, truly amazing. Um, but despite these 37 years of serving our community and empowering all of our constituents, our own organization um, is in a constant state of precarity. And I'm not, con I'm concerned not only for ourselves, but for the general lack of support to the Asian American community, um, which makes up 16% of the city's population. And as we face mounting numbers of violent anti-Asian attacks, um, our, our community's organizations are regularly underfunded while our services are in increasing demand. And you know, even before the pandemic, um, the city was disproportionately underfunding Asian American led and serving cultural organizations. And I know last year, um, DCA awarded like a record number of grants and that's amazing through the Cultural Development Fund. But you know, of those more than 1000 organizations that were funded, only 59 were Asian serving or a mere 5.7%. And out of all of those, only seven of those grants, a mere 3% were for amounts of $50,000 or more. And yet the total percentage of grants awarded in excess of 50,000 was 211 or 20%. So what, again, why are we getting 3% when the average is 20%? So, you know, and these numbers, they don't take into that consideration, of course, the CIGs of which not a single one is led by an Asian American. So um, again, Hi. I just want to I just want to close out and say that I know that all arts organizations and all artists are really hurting, but I really fear that Asian Americans and other people of color have suffered disproportionately during the pandemic and we need your support to recover. And I really worry that this budget is going to be borne any budget cuts are going to be borne too heavily by our community. So I just ask, I beg of you actually, I beg when you are allocating the budget that you do not compound to the injustice upon Asian Americans and ensure that there's full transparency and there's careful consideration in this budget to ensure that the city lives up to its promises of equitable funding and support for historically underserved communities. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Olson. Um, we will now hear from Kimberly Olson, Executive Director of New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Ms. Olson, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, as well as Commissioner Consoles and the staff at uh, DCLA for your leadership and commitment to arts education. I also want to say it's such a pleasure to hear from our colleagues um, in the public library system, where I actually began my career as a teaching artist working at the Steinway branch of the Queens Public Library. Um, my name is Kimberly Olson, and I'm the, now the Executive Director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. The Roundtable is a grassroots service organization that builds its efforts around the values that arts are essential and that arts education is a right for all New York City students. As our city begins to rebuild and envision a post-pandemic era, 
era, I'm here to highlight the importance of investing in arts education as part of the city's recovery process. The long-term effects of COVID-19 on students and schools will take years to understand. However, the trauma, systemic racism, and learning loss related to COVID-19 are stark realities happening now that students face every day in the classroom. The need for investment and equity in arts education comes at a time when the arts in our schools have never been so important. New York City is missing the opportunity to invest in authentic ways to build social emotional competencies of youth living through these traumatic times. We're also missing the chance to instill in our youth the power of imagination, creativity, that's not only needed for arts-based professions, but careers like engineering, uh, healthcare, and computer software design. And lastly, we're also failing to engage a workforce of thousands of artists who are primed to expand student opportunities and advance equitable access to arts learning. This year and every year, the arts will be key to reigniting student learning in a post COVID era and preparing them for success and joy in a, 20, a complicated 21st century world. Uh, so to rebuild the cultural workforce and also help sustain arts in our schools, we believe the city must restore that 70% cut to art services that happened at the DOE and also work to restore cuts to the CASA and SUCASA programming as well. Thank you so Time much. Expired. Thank you so very much. Um, we will now hear from Ms. Sheila Lewandowski. Executive Director, Chocolate Factory Feeder, Ms. Milandowski, whenever you're ready. Is Sheila here? I haven't seen her. Okay, um, so next we will move on. Um, to the next panel, which Wait, is... Anna, Anna, can I just, I wanted to say uh, just a few things about um, uh, some of the comments on this panel. Um, uh, I just want to say, Lisa, thank you um, for um, uh, saying uh, what needed to be said. And uh, I just want to say, as you may or may not remember, I voted against the budget uh, last year. Um, in part because I did not believe that we did the right thing on many different levels. Um, and uh, I still believe that we um, overfunded the police department uh, and underfunded <laughs> um, desperately needed programs and services, particularly uh, in um, uh, black, uh, brown, and Asian communities, and and cutting the arts at all in this moment, particularly as some folks spoke uh, to uh, arts and education funding, which was decimated in our schools, um, is the wrong way uh, to go. So I will just uh, commit Lisa to to do my part um, uh, and to use my voice um, and my position to to try uh, to do what I can, knowing that this is a a massive system uh, and and uh, 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 and I, I cannot move all of it in the way that I wish that I could, but but I but I will use my voice as I did last year um, to call. Um, for us to um, uh, appropriately uh, reimagine public safety in this city um, and, and use the funding that we have in ways that will um, address some of the uh, systemic racism and inequities that you talk about um, that will ultimately also uh, make the city more just and safe at the same time. So, I realize that this is a much longer conversation um, and you all are, are giving quick two minute testimonies and then and then I chime in, but I did not want to let um, this panel go without saying something um, to let you know that I, I, I hear you, I see you um, and, and I believe um, that it is my obligation to follow through on, on what you said. 
Thank you, Chair. At this moment, I also would like to remind Council members, if you have questions for a particular panelist or a panel, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. I see no questions. Therefore, we will now move on to the next panel. The next panel will be James J. Kalafi, Jr., President of IASTSE Local 1, followed by Lisa Alpert, Vice President of Development and Programming in Greenwood, Francine Garber-Cohen, President, Regina Opera Company, Alejandro Duke Sifuentes, Executive Director, Dance New York City. Mr. Kalafi, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. James, you have to um, unmute yourself. You're still muted, sir. My apologies. Chairman Van Bramer, distinguished members of city council. I've had the privilege of meeting some of you before. I'm James Claffey Jr., president of Local One and international president of the International Alliance's Theatrical Stage Employees. I am here today to provide testimony on behalf of the coalition of IATSA unions, collectively representing over 15,000 members of which 500 theatrical workers representing more than a dozen crafts at the Metropolitan Opera House. There can be no productions of grand opera at the Metropolitan Opera House with all these union professionals in their crafts. However, the Met Opera under the leadership of General Manager Peter Gelb is now subjecting our members to a union busting scheme. For this reason, the IA uh, Metropolitan Co Opera Coalition is asking the New York City Council to refrain from providing funding to the Met Opera in the city budget. You all likely know that Local One's membership, at least our stage crew of more than 350 uh, stage and shop workers at the Met Opera have been locked out for more than 14 weeks by the Met's management. While Local One is the only union that's been locked out so far, as a practical matter, our situation creates a de facto lockout for other workers represented by the IETSC through the interconnected, interconnectedity of our work. In addition, most of the other unions represent, uh, representing workers at the Met are working under expired contracts or have been asked to reopen collective bargaining agreements early for the purpose of providing massive concessions to the opera company. The purported rationale for the concessions, an overwhelming amount of which are work rules, is premised on the impact of the COVID-19 on the Met opera. In reality, the Met's demands utilize the pandemic, pandemic as leverage to obtain non-COVID-19 related concessions. Examples of such concessions include a 30% reduction in pay that extends for years with no relation to the end, to the end of the pandemic and work will changes that imperil health, safety and quality of life for our members who are typically required to work 75 hours a week with around the clock schedules and weekend work. When looking at management's demand for concessions, it is clear that there's no I'm nexus. Excited. There's no- Feel free to continue, Jim. My thanks, Mr. Chairman. It is clear there is no nexus with COVID-19 and the global pandemic is a mere pretext to bust the unions and gut the contracts fairly negotiated over many decades. We recognize that Met's finances are impacted by the pandemic. Our members are also greatly impacted. Workers have lost employer health, uh, employer health care contributions and struggled through the unemployment process. It is, it is this for, the, for this reason that our union and many other unions whose members work at the Met are prepared to consider concessions while the opera house is shuttered. To this point, we have seen examples where other institutions have worked closely with their unions to craft mutually agreed upon collective bargaining agreements that recognize the harm the pandemic is inflicting on our institution. As you can see in our submitted testimony, which is, which is lengthy beyond the two minutes I've been afforded. So if you take a look, Mr. Gelb and management are not demanding massive union concessions to account for the impact of COVID-19, but rather as compensation for their historical pattern of poor financial decisions. It is important to emphasize Mr. Gelb is systematically engaged in financially risky, flawed and failed management, which he then seeks to paper over with demands that the Met Opera workforce should, cut or, should uh, shoulder the cost of his blunders. The Met claims a need to reduce costs and yet expands, spends huge sums of money on management and on scrapping and replacing productions commissioning too many new productions that cost millions with no realistic expectation even a break even financial return. This was, not, this was not the prior case, the case prior to Mr. Gelb's tenure. 
The consistency of Mr. Gelb's financial mismanagement has led to his increasing belief that the remedy to the opera company's problems is to bust the Mets unions, the Mets unions. Instead of negotiating fairly, Mr. Gelb has chosen to lock out local one and outsource up to a year of set and scenery work. Two productions slated to be in, produced in Met's in-house shop have been subcontracted to Bay Productions in Cardiff, Wales, and another will, will be built in a non-union shop on the West Coast. While Mr. Gelpin sincerely and publicly declares a need for sacrifice on all sides, he has chosen the path in which the quality of life the workers is the sacrifice. The Met's demands would take away overtime rules, reduce sick day, accrual vacation, uh, vacation pay, remove calm time and reduce benefits. These take it or leave it demands impact the livelihood and safety of the workers. These items have been gained in mutual exchange over decades of bargaining. In effect, Mr. Gelb is demanding to return our agreement to 1999's terms. Therefore, the coalition of IA unions request that the New York City Council not provide funding to the Metropolitan Opera, including capital grants in the city budget while it remains engaged in its agenda of union busting. We believe that the city withhold public funds from the Met. You'll be sending a clear message that policymakers expect nothing short of a good faith negotiation between the Met and its unions. And to be clear, a negotiation which Peter Gelb presents all nine pages of his proposals as a take it or leave it proposition does not constitute good faith bargaining and should not be rewarded with public dollars. And thank you for the opportunity to appear on behalf of the members of the I Union Coalition. And I am certainly available to answer any questions you choose to ask. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. And uh, as you may have heard in my discussion with the uh, unions representing all of our library workers earlier, um, and of course my own personal history being um, uh, coming from a union family, uh, it is uh, absolutely unacceptable that uh, the Met or any other organization would try and uh, break unions um, and uh, strip away hard earned uh, um, benefits that uh, workers uh, deserve. So um, you, you have our, our support and our solidarity and happy to do anything in my role uh, as the cultural affairs chair to, uh, uh, to weigh in on behalf of the workers who are fighting this fight. So um, thank you and, and we should definitely uh, talk uh, after the hearing and, um, and see uh, which ways, in which ways we can uh, help ampl amplify the fight. That'd be greatly appreciated, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear from Ms. Lisa Alpert, VP of Development and Programming, Greenwood. Ms. Alpert, please, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Hi, uh, hello, Chair Van Bramer. My name is Lisa Alpert. I'm the Vice President of Development and Programming at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And for geographical context, Greenwood is in South Brooklyn, borders six different neighborhoods, including Sunset Park and Park Slope. So in the quality time we're going to share together in the next two minutes, I want to just make four critical points. Number one, uh, Greenwood Cemetery is really big, and we are an irreplaceable asset for Brooklyn and all of New York City. We're 478 acres, that's just slightly smaller than Prospect Park, and we feel a responsibility and an obligation to share this incredible resource with the community. And we embrace that responsibility every day. How do we do that? Number two. More than 250 pu public programs every year, including concerts, performances, and art installations. Fully staffed education department serves thousands of kids. Uh, workforce development training, groundbreaking work with Cornell on fighting climate change, high school internships. Access and equity is our goal, as always. Number three, something incredible happened at Greenwood last year, uh, last spring when COVID hit. Greenwood opened and staffed all four of its entrance gates seven days a week until 7 p.m. every night. And that changed the number of people who come to Greenwood annually from 300,000 to just under 600,000 people in 2020, not at all at the same time, don't worry. Um, which means Greenwood is now better known and loved by Brooklynites than ever before. But number four, uh, we have a big challenge and a big opportunity. We currently have no indoor space for programming. That means when it's cold or raining or snowing, we cannot serve our community. We lose almost four months of the year. Our capital project and education and welcome center will allow year round programming, which is especially important here in South Brooklyn, which is culturally significantly underserved. 
We also, we have raised 65% of the funds. We are seeking the support of the city council on this very important capital project. Thanks. Anna, is that uh, this panel? Uh, yes, I was wondering whether you wanted to make any remarks. Fair enough. Um, yes, uh, thank you uh, to all of the folks uh, on this panel, uh, some of the folks who are uh, gone, and, and Lisa will certainly uh, take a look at that. I am a big fan of Greenwood and uh, know exactly where it is. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank Next you so panel. much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Ms. Francine Garber Cohen, president of Regina Opera Company, followed by Alejandro Duke Sifuentes, executive director of Dance New York City. Ms. Garber Cohen, whenever you're ready. Yes. I'm first now. Uh, thank you, council members and art supporters. Uh, I'm Fran Garber Cohen, president of Regina Opera. For 50 years, Regina Opera has offered fully staged operas with full orchestra and English super titles, as well as many concerts. We provide affordable entertainment in accessible venues for audience members who might not otherwise attend live performances. The performances bring happiness and empathy to our audiences. We perform three fully staged operas each season consisting of four ticketed performance and one totally free performance. We also feature many free concerts in parks, libraries and festivals and ticketed concerts in our theater located in Sunset Park all of which bring foot traffic and business to local restaurants and shops. The need for this cultural enrichment is reflected in the fact that over 4,000 people usually attend our live performances. Again, most of which are in Sunset Park, an underserved low income community. Due to COVID-19, Regina Opera lost one year of live performances, but we have been actively posting our archived operas and opera selections free and on demand on our YouTube page for a total of over 40 offerings, and we've had over 20,000 views. Not a lot compared to other people, but we are a small organization. The arts are particularly vital to New York City. They are uplifting to the spirit, especially for senior citizens who may live alone. With, as with all the arts organizations, we don't know when we will again er, earn sufficient income through ticket sales and donations. As a result, we are relying upon DCLA and city council members funding, such as that of council I'm members excited. Menchaca and Brannon. The funding will help alleviate some of the pain and insecurity that we, like most cultural institutions, have been facing. Thank you. Chair, would you like to make a remark? Thank you. Thank you, Francine. Okay. Thank you so very much. Um, next, we will hear from Alejandra Duke Sifuentes, Executive Director of Dance New York City. Uh, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Hello, everyone, and thank you, uh, Council Member, and to the committee for having me here today. My name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes. I'm the Executive Director of Dance NYC, coming to you from my um, home and office in Forest Hills, Queens, New York. Um, I am uh, speaking on behalf of Dance NYC and the dance sector and industry that we represent. Uh, well over uh, 5,000 individual artists, dance making groups for and nonprofit organizations and independent artists. Um, today, I am joining my colleagues and advocating for the city to maintain the budget for arts and culture without making any budget cuts. As um, Council Member Van Bramer said earlier, culture never closed. And um, while the 
funding that is set aside for culture is small in proportion to everything else that the city um, allocates funds to, the return is incredibly high. Our artists and cultural workers have continued to serve our community in this time. They have risen um, across a variety of advocacy movements like Dance Rising with performers all around the city. Um, they have supported our educational institutions and our students. They are workers embedded across many other parts of our city and the different sectors. And so we want to just recognize how necessary this support is in continuing to support these organizations, these businesses, and these workers. We also want to affirm that the funding that is designated um, allows for arts workers to be paid living wages for institutions to be required to pay these living wages um, in a way that is true for a New York City economy. We also want to encourage a council to designate funds and initiatives that support Black, Indigenous, and folks of color-led organizations, disabled-led, immigrant-led, and the organizations that are specifically serving those communities I, without which we can't continue to do this work. Um, this year has been of great impact, but we know that culture is what will bring New York City back. And it's what has distinguished New York City for decades and generations across the world. So please continue to support us. Thank you, Alejandra, um, for uh, bringing, you know, such a, a, a clear and powerful voice uh, to these issues and obviously uh, your leadership over the last uh, year, um, not just for uh, the dance community, but for the greater cultural community and obviously um, uh, being a, a real, real fierce, um, um, you know, speaker of truth around uh, uh, equal access and justice uh, for BIPOC communities and particular artists um, and doing all of that from the greatest borough in the world in Queens. So, um, and I realize that everyone else who speaks now who doesn't live in Queens, I sort of just um, declared a preference, but um, I think folks understand, but Alejandra, thank you for uh, everything you do for all of us really. Thank you so very much. Uh, since there are no questions from council members, we will move on to the next panel, which will consist of Lauren Kamira, board chair, Urban Librarians Unite, followed by Miral Agish, Queen's Memory, Tara Brady, Queen's Library Guild, and Margaret Connors McQuay, Hispanic Society of America. Ms. Kamira, whenever you're ready, please. Thank I'm you. starting now. Um, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and the council members who've come to this committee for giving me this chance to testify today. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to think of how to condense the experience of the last year and sort of our hopes and dreams about what libraries should be and are into two minutes. And I, I don't think I can. Um, so you don't have to, Lauren. Yeah. I will give you more time. I'm just kidding. Because... Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> All of my colleagues have talked so much about how we pivoted and went to virtual services and changed how our entire field works. And I just wanna acknowledge that New York City library workers led the country and the world in how we've done that. Um, there are people from Australia who have come and asked us what we're doing, who have sat in on our programs and then taken it back to their own country and done it there. There are people from Canada asking us how we do things. We have led the country and the world in how we jumped right back into serving our community after the incredible, like impactful event of having to suddenly shut down and go home. Um, and all of my colleagues have talked about the services we've provided, but I think with the budget, we talk about a budget as a statement of priorities all the time, every year. And for me, one of my priorities is building community and fighting the isolation that we've felt over the last year. Uh, libraries in jumping into virtual services have created these online spaces for interaction and social, just social interaction that don't exist anymore because we can't get together in person. 
um, in a way that we needed desperately. Isolation is a horrible thing to have happen to you. And for a full year. I'm expired. Do that. Um, I just want to tell the story of my knitting group because without those women, I don't know how I would have made it through the last year myself. Um, we have a knitting group at my branch that meets every Friday at 11. And there are people joining this group from Harlem, Staten Island, Brooklyn Heights, my, like Williamsburg, South Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Arizona, Tennessee, the Carolinas, like people who would never have met each other in person can now get together and we all know everybody's business. We just hang out and talk and laugh every Friday at 11. It's not visible to the council. It's not visible to the city because it's in Zoom and it's like this, it's hidden. This sort of joy filled hour every Friday in the middle of all of this awful stuff is hidden from view. And I just wanna make sure that the council knows that those things are happening, that there are bits of joy being created by library workers all over this city. Relationships in my knitting group where they go from my program to a coloring program, to a program at Queens, to something in Staten Island, they're all in the same book club. They're a group of friends that came together because of the library in the midst of a giant tragedy. Um, the power of that needs to continue and it needs funding. Um, that that's that's it just you know we can keep doing it but we need the funding to continue thank you lauren um obviously like so many other folks who are here and i really just want to say thank you to all the folks who are waiting um i'm looking at the the final list of all the folks who are testifying um and i see you lucy and uh Shade and and so many others um uh but, but Lauren, we've known each other for uh, many years. Um, we have fought alongside one another for many years. You have, um, <laughs> we used to have rallies on the steps of City Hall before these hearings, right? And we you would again. often, yeah, we will again. Uh, but you would often um, uh, represent uh, Urban Librarians Unite and, and library workers and have incredibly powerful things to say. Um, sometimes with your daughter in tow, right? Am I correct? Yes. She's um, in online school at the moment. Fair, fair. Um, so just thank you for for your eloquence and, and passion. And, um, you know, we're just really, really grateful to uh, to you and all library workers. And I know that I I don't see your, your, your knitting group, obviously, but uh, just know that as the chair of this committee, I do see library workers, right? And I do know um, their, their incredible value to, to the city. Um, so, uh, and I know they bring joy in, in an impossible time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Next we'll hear from Miral Agish, Queen's Memory, followed by Tara Brady, Queen's Library Guild. Miral Agish, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. I don't think I see that person on. Uh, I see Jocelyn waving her hand. Okay, in that case. But I don't, is Jocelyn, are you from the Queens Library, Jocelyn? She is. Um, um, we have Tara Brady of Queen's Library Guild. Um, whenever you're ready. I thought we already had the Hi, library the, guilds. Oh, no, I'm, 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 a, I'm a librarian. Here, <laughs> I'm a member here. of the Library Guild. Uh, my name is Tara Brady and I'm a teen librarian at the Queen's Central Library in Jamaica. Uh, one year ago this week, the Coding Club for Teenagers that I'd hosted every week for over two years had what was to be its last meeting. It's hard to imagine now, but at the time, I thought if we saw service changes due to COVID, we might reduce room capacities, maybe even close for a few weeks, but not much more than that. So when two of my longtime participants had a breakthrough in the code they were writing for their robot, I told them without hesitation that next time we'll let it run around the room and see what it can do. Their eyes lit up. Uh, there still hasn't been a next time. 
In the weeks to follow, I was amazed and inspired by all the ways my colleagues found to keep on serving their communities. You've heard a lot about virtual programming, grab and go service and take home program kits, of course. But within days, we were also up and running with chat, email and text message reference services from home. Uh, that's a service I haven't heard mentioned as much, and it's so important. Working remotely, I've walked people of all ages through accessing the many services available on our website, uh, worked with teachers to put together electronic resources for their suddenly remote classes, and helped so many people find alternate ways to get the services they'd normally get from us in person. A bit later on, we were able to restart phone reference services as well, which for many of our patrons is a lifeline. <coughs> I'm so glad I've been able to keep reaching patrons in this way. Nobody wants to live through a year like this, but if I had to, I can't think of a better place to do it than at Queens Public Library, where I have so many opportunities to serve my community every day, even from my cute little Kew Garden Studio apartment. I know this hasn't been the most visible work. You can't stop by a branch for a tour right now and see everything we're doing, but we're finding new ways to help our communities all the time, and we are so close. Once we're finally able to safely reopen, our patrons are going to need us more than ever. We're going to be helping kids who have been desperately underserved by remote schooling get caught back up. We're going to be rebuilding the sense of community that those who gather in our spaces feel, and I know a little robot who's still waiting for the chance to test his stuff in my program room. As we find our way through the coming months and years, we're going to need all the help and support we can get. Thank you. I'm excited. Thank you. Perfect timing, uh, Tara. Thank you so very much, Ms. Brady. We will now hear from Ms. Margaret Connors McQuaid, Hispanic Society of America. Whenever you're ready. I'm first now. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you all for providing this opportunity today. My name is Margaret Connors Equade. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. The Hispanic Society, located on 155th Street and Broadway, was founded in 1904 as a museum and library dedicated to the art and culture of the Hispanic world. For several years now, we've been working to restore and renovate our buildings to bring them up to current standards, provide full universal accessibility. During the renovation, we brought our educational program to the local schools in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. These programs, which are offered at no cost, have helped fill gaps in the arts curriculum for many of the schools we serve. We also have concerts, lectures, and tours of our Vision of Spain uh, gallery, all free of charge. We are currently closed due to the pandemic, but we have significantly increased our engagement through online programs, including lectures, concerts, cooking demonstrations, and a virtual summer camp organized together with our uptown um, colleagues at cultural organizations. And finally, we used our terrace to present uh, an outdoor installation last fall. And we are now planning another outdoor exhibit with the Northern Manhattan Art Alliance, NOMA, to exhibit a mural created by local artists. The use of our outdoor space is particularly important for a community hit hardest by this pandemic. We've been fortunate to be able to keep our staff intact during the pandemic. Those of you who have been to the Hispanic Society know that we have some of the most impressive galleries for experiencing art in the city, but you also know that our buildings are in great need of significant and costly upgrades. We had hoped and still hope that we can count on the city for our ongoing capital projects. We are uniquely positioned to serve as a major cultural hub in Upper Manhattan and in New York City, but we can't do that without a private public partnership. We've been successful in raising private funds, but need the city's support to bring this institution into the light it deserves. We are committed to deepening our mission to better serve the wider public in meaningful ways. Yeah. Thank you so much. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I would just like to take a moment um, to say that we will go back at the end to anyone who we have missed. So please don't worry, we will get back to you. Um, and now we will move on to our, um, to our next panelist. Um, the next there are only two more panels, just to be clear, there are only two more panels. Right. Um, so the next panel will consist of Jessica Chen of J. Chen Project, Carol Oaks, the 52nd Street Project, Christina Perry, League of Independent Feeder, and Said Lithcote, National Black Feeder. Ms. Chen, whenever you're ready, please. Yeah. Time starts now. Hi, 
Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you, Chair Van Bremer, Council Members, and my colleagues for the time to speak today. Today is my first time testifying live. Thanks to my mentors, Lisa Gold, Lucy Sexton, so many more. I'm Jessica Chen, Artistic Director of J. Chen Project, a modern dance company founded in 2008, established as a 501c3 nonprofit in 2017. JHM Project has a demonstrated history of diversity and inclusion with immigrants, BIPOC, including Asian Pacific Americans and the LGBTQ community. My company is filled with vibrant, passionate individuals that if given the chance, will continue to bring art and beauty to this great city. Right now, my community is also hurting. So I am here in solidarity with my arts colleagues to urge significant investment in arts and culture now. I do want to share a story of uh, Ruby with you today. Ruby came to New York City for the first time to attend our J10 Project Mentee Program in 2014. She was a rising junior at the time at the Orange County School of the Arts in California, where I often teach. And at age 16, she was already planning and dreaming about the ways that she wanted to make a difference in her community. She is now a New Yorker, a graduate of the NYU Tandon School of Engineering class of 2020, and is currently visioning and building for a better New York. Arts and culture bring bright and talented people to New York every year, whether they work in the arts or not, like Ruby, and dance and a city filled with artistic expression brought her to New York, and we need people like Ruby to revive and rebuild our city. Arts and culture will play a leading role in New York's economic vitality and robust recovery. And to do so, we need relief and support. So let's get our creative workers vaccinated and back to work. Thank you so much for your time and opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear from Carol Oaks, the 52nd Street Project, followed by Christina Perry. Ms. Ox, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, Council Members. I'm Carol Oaks, the Executive Director of the 52nd Street Project. The project, coming up on its 40th anniversary, is a community-based arts organization located in and serving the young people of Hell's Kitchen. We work with underserved kids starting at the age of nine or 10, and they stay with us for eight years until they graduate high school and even beyond with scholarship programs for higher education. Our programs are free to the children who participate and our performances are free to our audiences. Reaching approximately 150 kids each year, we have been running virtual programs since March, continuing to engage our members. I will tell the story of one young woman as an illustration of the impact that the arts and long-term service to a community can have. This child started with the project when she was 10 years old. She did not really speak to adults. When you spoke to her, she looked down, shrugged her shoulders. And whenever she was asked a question, you could barely hear what she said and never offered an opinion of her own. We stuck with her and still talked to her, asked her questions, engaged with her when we knew the conversation would be minimal. We invited her to every program possible and she always said yes. She participated in programming, in performing and writing programs as well as backstage crew, just to name a few. Today at 17, she is extremely vocal, starts topics of conversations, chooses to share her thoughts with us. She is the most consistent member of the teen ensemble. We were in rehearsal for a virtual show when her mother sadly suddenly passed away this winter. She chose to complete the program. Even though she has struggled with school through the pandemic and her mother's illness, she attends every meeting of college prep. She wants to continue acting in college. This is the type of impact the arts and community can provide. It is critical, critical that the DCA funding be kept whole in order to support the crucial work I'm inspired. of arts organizations during this pandemic and in order that the city survive and recover with the economic energy and community strengthening work of culture. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. It's a devastating story, but uh, very powerful. And those stories needs to be need to be told. And thank you. As someone who's been doing this work for a long time, uh, it just recalled some other stories that uh, I uh, I've experienced where people's uh, particularly young people's lives were changed by the arts. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. We will now hear from Ms. Christina Perry of League of Independent Feeder, followed by Said Lithcold. Ms. Perry, whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Councilman Van Bramer. Always good to see you. Um, good to see you. Yes, so good. And Commissioner Gonzalo, I look forward to finally being able to meet you in person one of these days. Um, so I'm Christina Perry. I'm with the League of Independent Theaters. We represent over 300 venues with 99 seats or less. And I also operate two theater venues in Midtown Manhattan known as the Chain Theater. So I'm here as a member of the League and to also um, give a personal account as a venue operator. So first of all, I cannot speak at any local city or state hearing without first mentioning rent relief. It is our greatest need right now. And we know that you, our city representatives, have the ears of those in state. And we ask that you continue to voice this overwhelming need um, as we also wait on further action with proposed bill 1796. So that said, um, we for years, not for profits, were always looking for ways to save. And we have an idea that we feel would be really substantial to our industry. Um, an important ask I'd like to address today is the need for a not-for-profit rate from Con Edison that eliminates us from being classified as a large commercial venue. I can personally share that our organization pursued this five years ago when we first had a space in LIC. And after numerous attempts, we were told that because we didn't own the building, we did not qualify for this. And the reality is small arts organizations like mine can't afford their own building. So if we can't afford our own building, it's safe to say we probably really can't afford to be classified as a large commercial venue with Con Edison. So this is money that would save us thousands of dollars each year, and it would go to further programming, community events, paying artists and gig workers. And this is money we already have that's in our budgets that can be reallocated. So I'm asking today to have uh, help us create this change. It's a change that would not pull from the city budget, but would save our organizations so much. So we see this as a great way for the city to help our arts organizations financially during this time without actually pulling from the budget um, and so I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to speak, and I look forward to further discussing how we can actually make this happen. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Next, we will hear from Ms. Said Lithko of National Black Feeder. Whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Van Bramer, um, for your leadership, but not just your leadership, your passion and your tremendous heart. Thank you all, um, also to all the esteemed members of the committee present today and Commissioner Casals. My name is Shade Lithcott. I testify today as the CEO of the National Black Theater, the longest continually run Black Theater in New York City. I'm also proudly serve as the chair of coalitions of theaters of color, a coalition that represents the largest body of culturally specific theaters in all five boroughs. What BIPOC communities have endured this past year is nothing short of a war. And I'm not sure why we're not calling it that. The numbers make it poignantly clear between the pandemic, the uprisings and the tyranny of systemic racism, it has felt like an all out assault on our communities specifically. From the exponential rise of anti-Asian violence to the disproportionate COVID-19 deaths in black and brown communities, life has been fragile and fleeting, but most starkly uncertain. The BIPOC organizations that are funded through the CTC initiative have been on the front lines of this war as safe havens for the communities, um, sorry, um, for the communities in which we operate. We have been doing the work for generations, not just in this moment, as we have just brilliantly heard from sister Lisa Gold of A4. Even in this year of extreme challenge and trauma, our CTC organizations have continued to serve hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers in the hardest hit communities with vitally needed cultural, educational, social, and economic resources for youth, seniors, and families in local neighborhoods and to the broader residents living in the outer boroughs. From the anti racism training courses conducted by the Caribbean Cultural Center in East Harlem. Time expired. Um, keep going, please, Shelley, keep going. Thank you. To the digital education 
and activism of the Chinese theater works in Queens to art therapy that the mind builders in Bronx offer kids, some who have lost both parents to COVID-19. For us, this testimony is not about money. This is about our lives and the well-being of our communities. Cuts to the CTC would be destabilizing and will undoubtedly mean that over half of our theaters will be gone for good. Some that represent the only theaters of their kind in the country like Amarinda, serving and empowering American Indians. Last year, I came to you to remind you that budgets are moral narratives. They hold up a mirror to our values. They reflect back our priorities. Every vote, decision, and cut tells a story. And you heard us, and we are so grateful for that. We are asking that you continue to stand with us, and not, but not only no harm come to the CTC initiative, but that you are fund, but that our funding becomes baseline, so that the support from our beloved city is no longer uncertain or insecure. We're asking that you make a secure annual investment in our organizations so that at least on this front, we have peace of mind that we can plan a future. Our DCLA funding is mostly through CDF, which is competitive and uncertain. This baselining this funding would mean everything for the future of our communities. Together, we have the sacred responsibility of imagining and manifesting a new and more equitable city. This is your chance, like the artists we all revere so, to be creative. As Chair Van Bramer says, think out of the, outside the box, be bold and take courageous steps towards budget justice to shine a light in these dark times into the spaces that need it most. So grateful to be able to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shade. And I just want to say um, a member of my staff, as you were giving your testimony, said Shade for president. Um, and uh, I, I concur. Um, you know, and, and look, there's so much more that needs to be done. Uh, but, you know, I, I will just say that the fight that I brought last year um, and uh, the vote that I took, <laughs> which did not come uh, without some consequences, um, uh, but, but it was the right thing to do. Um, and, uh, and so I will bring that same energy, dare I say fierceness as a gay man, um, to, uh, to, to this budget, um, because I, I believe it. I just, uh, a few days ago, I was walking along Greenpoint Avenue in Sunnyside and I ran into Angel, uh, who runs the Talia Spanish Theater, um, which is of course a member of the CTC. And, um, you know, it is a, it is a, a small, relatively small institution. Um, where I have enjoyed many, many performances. As you may know, it's one of the only bilingual um, theater companies in Queens. And, um, and it, it, it is this beautiful little space on Greenpoint Avenue and Sunnyside. And, and, uh, and, and it stays alive because of CTC and because of some of the, uh, obviously, grants that I provide as well. Um, so I, I, I believe in it. And I really appreciate you saying that this isn't about money, right? It's so much, um, uh, it's about sort of justice and, and survival in many ways. Um, and so, you know, all I can say to you is that, um, you know, I, I, I have demonstrated that I see you um, and, and I have uh, voted my conscience. Um, and I will continue to uh, do that as long as I have that uh, that ability and that obligation, right? I have a I have an obligation because of this position that I am in um, to do the right thing, and uh, and I will keep doing that. And I absolutely believe in baselining. Um, we have fought for years um, to baseline both library and cultural funding. Um, because, uh, you know, I remember when I was a, a staff person at the Queens Public Library, this is many years ago, um, and it was after 9-11, and there were huge budget cuts, and I was a relatively junior staff member in the, in the external affairs, government affairs department, and, um, and there were layoffs, and folks got layoff notices, 
and a much older man. Um, uh, he was a uh, uh, Haitian. Uh, stopped by my cubicle and and uh, and begged me to help save his job because he knew that I had some access to elected officials, right? And that that was part of my job was to fight for budget, fight against budget cuts. Um, and I'll, I never forget those conversations and how and how much real people's lives are impacted um, and how frightened this person who was much more my senior was uh, about losing his livelihood and his ability to care for his family. Um, and that I had some little role to play in that. Um, now I have a much larger role to play in that, um, but I never lose sight of those stories and of those people. Um, and when we baseline funding, uh, we, we take away that fear, right? That people live in all the time, that what little they have could be ripped away at any moment in time um, based on you know, some, some decision that gets made in a room, whether it's a Zoom room or a real room. Um, and folks will never know. They'll never know who, who made the cut, who, who agreed to it. Um, when it becomes public is when we vote, right? And when we speak to how and why we vote. And, you know, I will be a council member for 12 years. And the speech that I gave, uh, I spoke twice last June when we voted on the budget, right? And we, and we had so many uh, Black Lives Matter uh, uprisings, but also activists who were um, occupying City Hall or the park outside City Hall. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of the speech that I gave that, that, that night um, in defense of uh, activists and also recalling my own uh, personal history as a queer activist and ACT UP and, and how um, that movement, you know, changed the world um, and saved lives by being, um, by not being polite um, and by not asking for permission to, uh, to unequivocally state that our lives matter um, and, and that uh, queer people were dropping like flies and government didn't give a shit and like we had an obligation to, um, to do things. So um, yeah, you just got me thinking, Shade, as you often do uh, about all of these things. So I just wanted to uh, share my thoughts um, and, and also just offer my allyship and solidarity. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, so we're moving on to our next panel. And after this panel, we will go back to everyone we have missed. So please stand by. Um, the last panel will consist of Ms. Kathy Brewster Lee, Local 1321, Yashiris Morera, former director of New York Historical Society, Atiba Edwards, Lucy Sexton, Executive Director of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Ms. Kathy Brewster Lee, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Okay, it appears that she is not present. Um, Yashiris Morera. Uh, whenever you're ready, please. Um, good morning. I'm Yashiris Moretta, Vice President of Operations for Capital Projects for the New York Historical Society. Members of the Committee for Culture Affairs, thank you for your continued service to the arts and culture community in New York City, particularly during this challenging times. And thank you for the opportunity to offer my testimony on behalf of the New York Historical Society. The past year has been transformative for New York Historical and we have worked to respond quickly to unprecedented challenges while remaining committed to serving our audiences to the fullest. New York Historical continues to recover from significant setbacks since last March, including major losses in earned income and slow visitation. Despite these challenges, New York Historical has remained committed to its mission of creating museum programming that highlights under-recognized stories. Our history at home has served more than 31,000 students in the fiscal year 2020 and has reached over 94,000 students in this fiscal year. With limited staff now working on site in the museum, New York Historical has continued its exhibition schedule beginning with an outdoor exhibit called Hope Wanted, New York City Under Quarantine, 
and followed by many more. In fiscal year 2020, New York Historical partnered with the American LGBTQ Plus Museum to bring forth plans to construct the city's first major museum dedicated to LGBTQ plus history and culture. This project will provide critical workforce development and job creating opportunities, allowing New Yorkers to advance during this uh, economic recovery in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Due to financial and logistical setbacks resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, New York Historical will proceed with the construction of a phase approach, starting with the construction of a single story expansion with the superstructure to follow. In conclusion, New York Historical Society remains deeply grateful for the important programmatic and capital funds from New York City that have allowed us to expand our resources and adapt to the urgent needs of our local community. We thank I'm expired. City Council Member for your executive service and for hearing me today. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We will now hear from Atiba Edwards, followed by Lucy Sexton. Atiba Edwards, whenever you're ready, please. Good afternoon, Chair Edgar and members of the committee. My name is Atiba Edwards, and I'm the COO at Brooklyn Children's Museum and the committee chair of the Cultural Institutions Group Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access Committee. I'm here to testify on behalf of the CIGs, a coalition of 34 cultural organizations who share a private public partnership with the city of New York and are located in the five boroughs. First, let me begin by saying how grateful we are for the council's vital support for the culture and the arts in New York City throughout the years. Additionally, today's hearing marks a one year shift since we saw COVID-19 take over daily life and also the cultural industry's struggle with the paradigm shift. According to a recent study in 2020, CIG saw just under half a billion dollar in deficit due to revenue losses while investing millions in reopening. Organizations identified ways across New York City from mail and PPE distribution, volunteering space for blood drives, text, testing for vaccines, and overall, collectively, the CIG spent $2 million in order to ensure New Yorks were able to access quality virtual programming. And in total, these offerings reach about 10 million individuals, especially those hard hit by the pandemic. At Brooklyn Children's Museum, we've been able to provide space for half a dozen artists in our community to help through the unifying power of the arts. Additionally, as mentioned earlier, we are partnering with Brooklyn Public Library to offer a grab and go service in a community that just lost their library. Looking forward, CIGs are critical to the economic, economic recovery of the city. Staff wages and dollars from visitation across the cultural industry help reinvigorate the local economy. And also I wanna express our strong support for colleagues who are not members of the CIG, who we've worked alongside in the past year through our Culture Act 3 call, which has led to a number of initiatives such as funding for the Coalition of Theaters of Color, council initiatives, and additionally council initiatives like CASA and SUCASA are critically important. We deeply appreciate the council's unwavering support and ask you once again to ensure that culture is viable for New York City. We ask that the cultural budget be held harmless and maintained at fiscal 21 levels as we wait on further information around federal relief around the COVID pandemic that might be made available to the city. I'm inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Atiba. Were you done? Okay. <laughs> we would have let you go on uh, certainly longer. Um, and yes, it certainly will be interesting to see what the federal stimulus looks like for our city and what we decide to do with that uh, money, because we are talking about uh, simply holding culture and the arts and libraries and uh, programs and services harmless um, and uh, uh, keeping them the same. I want to know where that money is going. Right, um, and uh, we have an opportunity with the stimulus uh, on top of the budget situation not being as uh, dire as, as many have feared and predicted uh, to be in a position to actually add funding and to direct funding uh, to uh, black and brown communities and organizations. Uh, this is an opportunity um, and let's see what we as a city do with it. And I think Lucy, you're up. Yes, thank you, Chair, Ms. Lisa Sexton, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And uh, just before I even start my testimony, wanna say that yes, 
Um, other uh, states and cities have created dedicated uh, streams of their relief money towards the arts and culture sector. New York State and New York City needs to do the same. Ready to imagine that with you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the City Council for this important and urgent hearing. My name is Lucy Sexton. I'm the with the Cultural Advocacy Coalition, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Well, I realize we're talking about the budget and that this is a time of economic crisis. I think we need to talk about a radical reimagining of New York City, one with arts and culture supported in every community, helping every neighborhood recover economically and emotionally and laying the groundwork for an equitable and thriving city going forward. Arts and culture have led the city's economic recovery before, during past crises, inhabiting and revitalizing the hollowed out industrial spaces in the 70s, creating festivals that drew people downtown after 9-11, and getting people back on the streets and into businesses coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. Now is the time to invest in, not to cut, this critical economic driver. The benefits that arts and culture bring extend far beyond economics. Data has shown that neighborhoods with cultural assets have improved outcomes in education, aging, mental health, youth engagement with criminal justice, community strength, and safety. Every one of these areas will have hearings during this budget season. I ask you to remember the role culture plays in each area. So when you think of schools, remember strong arts programs leads to student success. When you think of safety, remember that community centers with cultural programs can disrupt patterns and lead to reduced crime rates. And we are insanely affordable. The city spends a mere quarter of a percent of its annual budget on the cultural programs that drive the economy, increase tax revenue, and show immeasurable improvements in the lives of its residents. In recent years, the council has worked hard to increase support of culture and we are so grateful. But right now, arts and culture are hanging on by a thread. Most cultural organizations remain partially or wholly shuttered. More than half our workforce remains unemployed. And the organizations most at risk are the ones most dependent on public funding, organizations disproportionately led by and serving BIPOC communities that have been hardest hit by all aspects of this crisis. I'm asking the council to break with conventional patterns of cutting arts and culture as some form of amenity. I'm asking that we push against a survival of the fittest approach and instead invest more robustly in the parts of our ecosystem most likely to disappear. We cannot come out of this terrible time with a decimated arts and culture landscape that is more white and more centralized than it was before. I want to be clear that we are fighting to hold harmless the support for every part of our cultural ecosystem, from CIGs serving hundreds of thousands of New York City New Yorkers, to arts and culture groups of every size who serve every community in the city with CDF funding, to critical initiatives including the Coalition of Theaters of Color and struggling CASA and Soup CASA programs for kids and seniors. In short, we ask that you protect every cent of the current cultural budget as if our city's life depends on it, because it does. Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you, Lucy. I'll have uh, a few more words as we wrap up. I think we have one or two more folks to testify, but uh, I, I feel everything that you just said. Thank you so much, Chair. So now we will go back to those who, um, who we missed. And we begin with Ms. Sara Espanol, librarian, Queens Library. Whenever you're ready, please. Okay, um, good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and all the members of the committee. My name is Sarah Espanol. I'm the children's librarian at the Glendale branch for Queens Public Library. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on such an important topic. In March of 2020, QPL closed our buildings to slow the spread of COVID-19. And right after that, I was able to join the library's virtual children's programming committee, along with some amazing colleagues of mine. We designed, um, children's programming for the virtual realm. Um, we started, I think within two weeks, <laughs> we had um, a schedule of story times on Facebook Live three times a week, um, one being a bilingual story time. 
And also for our school age children, we had two programs a week that featured chapter book read alouds, STEM classes, arts and crafts, and more. In partnership with our marketing department, we started developing contact for um, content for our YouTube page that included videos on early literacy, science experiments, and also instructional videos on how to access our digital collection. Um, as a children's librarian, our relationship with our local schools is very important, and I reached out to my local schools. And since the pandemic began, I have been doing monthly story times with my local special needs pre-K. This is to invoke normalcy and consistency with the students, and then also let the parents know about the resources that the library has to offer. I'm also on the summer reading committee because one of our big concerns is summer slide that our kids uh, lose the knowledge um, over the summer. We wanna keep them reading and there's that added difficulty of remote learning this year, last year and this year. So um, we used our platform Read Square to do a reading challenge. That way our families can log and track their reading over the summer. Once to go service began, I worked with my assigned branch making grab and go craft kits and I'm working with a fellow children's librarian on a virtual literacy program uh, focused on letter recognition. For me, the library is an essential part of the community. We work closely with our local schools. We want to provide our families and communities with the information and the tools that they need to help their children succeed. My personal goal as a children's librarian is to make every child a reader and to encourage reading and literacy in young people. I live in Queens. I have a school-aged child that remote learning did not work for. And the library has been an incredible resource for us. The ability just to check out eBooks before we were open and now to get books and other materials that we have grab and go service is invaluable. I am here today. I witness the positive impacts that library have on our community every day. I experience it myself in my personal life. Libraries have been there in the past and we will continue to be there for all of our customers helping them to meet their individual needs. Thank you for allowing me this time. Thank you, Sarah, for your testimony. And I think there are a few jobs more important than a children's librarian. And uh, really, really grateful for the work uh, that you do with the children in Glendale. And, you know, uh, just when, when I heard you say, was it special needs uh, pre-K four-year-olds that you're working with? I just was like, my goodness, uh, that is truly uh, uh, the work of unsung heroes, right? Where people um, like you are doing that work um, with, uh, with children. Um, so thank you. Just thank you for what you're doing and for being here and testifying. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Jocelyn Atahualpa, Local 1321, Queen's Library Worker. Whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. Um, good afternoon to all. Thank you, Chairman Jimmy Van Bremer and fellow committee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jocelyn Atahualpa. I'm the program coordinator for Queen's Memory at the Queen's Public Library. Queen's Memory is a joint community archiving project with Queen's College. In my personal capacity, I also coordinate the Centro Corona Mutual Aid Network in Corona, Queens, and have been a community organizer for the past decade in New York City. In this past year, I've helped hundreds of people survive the pandemic, and I don't say that lightly, but even even though I know this to be true, I find it hard to remember all that we've been through. The human ability to forget so quickly is a double-edged sword, and that's why community archiving projects like Queen's Memory at, the Q at QPL are so important. Not a lot of people understand all the labor New York City libraries take on. As the city shut down, Queen's Memory pivoted to a 100% remote team documenting in real time the devastation caused by COVID-19. We captured the initial shutdown, the work of those on the front lines, and the different phases of quarantine. We conducted panels and oral history interviews to learn about the impact of the pandemic on immigrants and small businesses in Queens. We've interviewed hundreds of New Yorkers, nurses, community organizers, those in power and everyday people who spoke on their experiences in their own terms. We didn't do this alone. We were able to activate over hundred volunteers, expanding the work, bringing in more support from QPL staff and exploring new technology. Our, our adaptability was quick and I commend us for that. 
It's surprisingly easy to forget all that's happened since the city shut down in March of last year. I don't say that because the things that happened weren't important or because it wasn't a lot. I say it because our brains tend to suppress trauma and crises for our own self-preservation. This past year showed us collectively more than any other singular event how precarious life in New York City can be. It's so important that every day New York City history be preserved. We need to have a material understanding of the ways in which our systems failed us so that we can change and fix them. There are many instances on a federal level, but also on a state and city level where New Yorkers were abandoned. And I don't ever want us to live through that again. New York City libraries among many things work to preserve our history and without it, we'd be lost, destined to repeat our mistakes. I hope I've given you some insight into our work and that you can support a strong future for our libraries in New York City. Um, thank you. And I know I still have time. So I just do want to add that I'm very thankful to everyone here for I've learned so much. And I feel like we all get here and bear our souls and beg for this funding, knowing that there are real consequences. The history proves that, right? And we don't say any of this in a vacuum, right? There are campaigns to tax the rich, campaigns to defund the NYPD. There are already ways that we can get and secure this money for our institutions. And we just need to escalate our strategies for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I um, uh, you know, we're, we're um, three and a half hours in um, and, uh, and, um, you know, I'm I'm writing down the things that that you said, uh, uh, Jocelyn. So thank you um, because it's 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 it may be three and a half hours in, but there are still incredibly powerful things being said and things that all of us um, are are receiving. Right. So I wrote down um, the ability to forget so quickly is a double edged sword, and and you talking about how. Um, moving on forgetting as a survival mechanism, you know, um, uh, is just incredibly moving. So thank you, because this is a week where all of us are sort of revisiting the trauma and, and very focused on sort of what we were doing a year ago today. Um, and uh, I saw a photo pop up on my sort of Facebook memory or whatever that thing is where, you know, a year ago you were doing this and I was sitting in an office my office meeting with Woodside on the move, taking a, a photo after we met. Um, and I see a, a bottle of hand sanitizer in the corner of the photo. And, and that's what I was doing to protect myself, right? Even though I was sitting really closely in a small confined office with two other people. Um, but it, 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 uh, it's just a reminder of sort of where we were and how we didn't really know how to protect ourselves or really, uh, what we were doing, but, um, you know, for me anyway, I feel like uh, we got very lucky, um, um, because we kept going, um, but a lot of people obviously, um, did not, but thank you. I love the project. Um, I just want to say, um, and, and the work that you're doing in Corona, uh, incredibly important. So it's, it's just really brilliant that the Queens Public Library, um, you know, cares about and invests in this project. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, next, we will hear from Ms. Adriana Mitchell, Supervisor of the Brooklyn Public Library. Whenever you're ready, please. Time starts now. Um, okay. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Van Bremer. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, all members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, uh, my name is Adriana Mitchell, and I am here today to provide testimony on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library and plead for the continued support of BPL's efforts in the borough of Brooklyn. I am proud and honored to have worked for the Brooklyn Public Library for almost 15 years in different capacities over the course of the years. I am currently the Neighborhood Library Supervisor for the Brighton Beach Library, and I have had the opportunity to work in different branches at BPL and experience the diversity and different needs for each community. At a personal level, my love for the library started as a Brooklynite parent with the need to have a free, safe, and inspirational environment for my child. She was a toddler at the time and found the attending story times, that attending story times provided that um, comfort and exposure I needed for me and my child. Growing up in Mexico City, I did not experience the benefits 
of attending libraries and the valuable services they provide. So I found uh, uh, in th that individual lives, regardless of who you are or where you come from. Now that my daughter is a young adult going to college, I am proud to say that the Brooklyn Public Library has contributed to her accomplishments and growth by providing her as well as many other young people in Brooklyn with internship opportunities, safe and inspirational spaces to be in, access to resources, books, information, etc. And thank you BPL and thank you to those in, that support libraries and believe in the power of improving and making lives better for all the people in Brooklyn. Many of our patrons are grieving the loss of jobs, loved ones, homes, health, etc. Help and support Brooklyn Public Library efforts to contribute to the support and healing that Brooklynites need through the access of literature, computer classes for older adults, technology assistance, cultural programming, opportunities for our most vulnerable to not feel isolated or at a loss. Please support us to continue providing and contributing to the joy of reading and storytelling and other educational and cultural programming where the people can continue to feel connected to their libraries, even if it's in a virtual world, mostly for now. Please help to continue to move forward to safely open our physical spaces by supporting our outdoor programming and enhancing our outdoor spaces to bring back our libraries to the one place that everyone is welcome and that unifies communities. Uh, Chair Van Bramer, it's good to see you again. Thank you all members of the committee. Um, I wanna thank you for everything, for your advocacy, for all that you have done, are doing and will continue to do uh, to support our library, so thank you. Thank you uh, for your powerful testimony and for your work. Um, I love hearing the stories of uh, library workers and mentioning the, the branches that uh, you all work at and having been to so many of them myself, obviously over the years uh, as a, a library uh, employee and the chair of the committee. And, you know, just listening to you, uh, Adriana, you reminded me that that several people throughout this hearing have, uh, you know, uh, said the words plead or uh, even in some cases uh, beg, right? And, 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 uh, it's outrageous that anyone would, um, you know, feel like um, we we need to do that to our government to fund libraries and the arts, right? Um, it it, uh, it should be understood <laughs> and accepted that government must play this role, right? And people obviously uh, need to hold government accountable and demand um, uh, what is needed for communities, but um, I just wanna to say to you and to everyone, um, we owe you, right? Like uh, this city um, owes uh, each and every one of you the funding and the respect that uh, you you deserve um, and that you rightly possess um, because of what you do. So I, I just wanted to to say that, and and I have been on the other side, of course, right? When I was a library uh, employee for eleven years, and and um, and uh, as an advocate, obviously in my own life and my activism. But you know, I, I just being on this side of the uh, equation, if you were, or the table. Um, I just want to express my 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 empathy for all that, that everyone is bringing to, to the, the hearing, right? Um, thank you. I think there's one more person to testify, last but not least. Yes, uh, Chair. Um, next and last speaker is Svetlana Nigrimovsky, whenever you're ready, yes. Time start now. I can read. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Svetlana Nigrimovsky. 
I'm the neighborhood library supervisor at the Shipsetway branch, Brooklyn Public Library. And I'm here to speak about the importance of public library system to New York City. Thank you to the cultural affairs and library committees for allowing me to testify. Brooklyn Public Library has always been a cultural, educational, recreational center and a favorite place for all Brooklyn residents. I have been working for Brooklyn Public Library for 20 years. For all those years, I've never seen patrons benefit more from our programs than this past year. Now, more than ever, I'm learning that the services we offer to the community are essential. Library workers are not considered frontline workers. However, Brooklyn Public Library, library's enthusiastic staff saved people, especially the elderly, from loneliness, depression, despair through virtual programs and services. For example, one of our virtual programs called Talent Without Borders gives an opportunity for people to come together and share the original music and poetry with the community. This program went far beyond Brooklyn and attracted participants from other countries. Our program participants always tell me that in the pandemic, while they are locked in their homes, this program has challenged their lives, changed their lives, saved them from loneliness, depression, has provided them emotional support and hope for the future. I would like to thank the committee for all the support that you have offered us in the previous years. Now, more than ever, we are asking you, do not cut our library's budget so we can continue this wonderful mission. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think uh, Anna will let us know, but I, I believe that's the last person to testify um, for today's hearing, almost four hours in. I want to thank all the folks who are left in the room. Uh, uh, Shade, thank you. I did uh, Jack shared some of your uh, uh, thoughts with me. I really appreciate that. I, I myself got a little choked up um, as uh, uh, you were sharing your testimony and then I was uh, uh, sharing some of my, my experiences and thoughts, which went deeper than I had intended to go uh, at the time, but, um, but I appreciate that. So um, I also just want to say, as I, I look out on the screen and you know, chairing this committee for the last 11 plus years, um, uh, there are so many women who come before this committee, uh, so many strong, fierce women, uh, so many women of color um, who are leading um, and leaders. And, and it's just uh, a privilege and an honor to, to really work for you and to be, um, you know, in, in this fight with you. So um, thank you uh, so much. Um, and having come from libraries and culturals, and the arts, right? Uh, women are everywhere um, in that, and more and more uh, as we're seeing um, and needing to see uh, as presidents and CEOs and uh, artistic directors and curators um, and, uh, and and leading. So, so thank you all. Obviously, we have a uh, way to go before we get to June and adopt this budget. But needless to say. Um, if we have learned anything, and I mean anything from these last 12 months, we will not adopt an austerity budget, right? We cannot have people mouthing the words about uh, black and brown communities disproportionately affected by the pandemic and, and then adopt an austerity budget, which will directly harm all of those very same people, right? That is why I voted no on the budget last June, but it's even more intense, right, this year, um, because we have all seen 
uh, all of this play out in um, in really horrific ways. So to to do an austerity budget is just the definition of insanity. So uh, um, uh, and it's morally wrong, right? It's 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 just morally wrong. So uh, so thank you all for being here, um, and we will obviously stay very close uh, throughout this fight. And with that. Uh, Anna, uh, it is appropriate to say this hearing is adjourned. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Chair. I just wanted to point out that we currently have no questions and we have concluded public testimony. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order in which your hand is raised. Please do so now. There seems to be no hands raised. So Chair, it appears that we concluded this portion. Thank you very much. Thank you to our, our library folks and our cultural folks, all of you that live in my heart all the time. Thank you so much. With this, hearing is adjourned. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.